All right. Good evening. I'd like to call to order this special meeting of the Governing Board of the Cave Creek Unified School District number 93. Today is Monday, August 31st, 2020. Roll call. I see that the five members of the Governing Board are here and the members um, of our le executive leadership team um, minus Dr. Miller. Is that correct, Dr. Burdick? You can just do a head nod. Okay. Uh, item 1.3, formal adoption of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Do we have a motion and a second to approve as presented? Member Brown? Aye. Busby? Aye. Hatcher? Aye. I'm an aye. Rich? Aye. Item 1.4, the Governing Board Secretary will review comments submitted by members of the public. Ms. Scotto? I'm going to assume we have members, we have comments from the public. Yes, President Hill. Okay, I will come back to that um, in a minute. Uh, item 1.5, if you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Uh, because we do have comments, I'll go to item two call to the public. According to ARS 38-431.01H, governing board members may not discuss or take legal action on matters raised during an open call to the public. The only allowable responses a governing board member may make are one, board member may respond if there is direct criticism of the board member, two, board member may direct staff to look into a matter, or three, board member can ask to have this item placed on a future agenda. Speakers need to be mindful of what they say when presenting to the board. Inappropriate comments could be considered slanderous. Slanderous. Uh, item three, we have no presentations, information, or reports. So item 4.1, resolution of the Cape Creek Unified School District, number 93, approving the designation of the applicant's agent form submission, to the Arizona Department of Emergency and Military Affairs, presented by Mr. Levy. Thank you, President Hill. Uh, members of the board, Dr. Burdick, uh, this is a resolution that we were notified that the governing board needs to approve to apply for the funding for the DEMA public assistance. Uh, this is the Department of Emergency Management uh, through the state and requires the, that a district designee uh, and an applicant's agent be uh, called out. And the administration would recommend that the governing board take the following action to move that the governing board approve the resolution of the Cave Creek Unified School District number 93, approving the de designation of the applicant's form submission to the Arizona Department of Emergency and Military Affairs as presented. So moved, Brown. Second, Busby. Any discussion or questions? Mr. Leedy, do you have any kind of a time frame when we may see any kind of funding? Um, Member Brown, this is... Um, this is open. So uh, the way the sequence of events is going to work is that we've applied for the ESSER grant and we've uh, received substantial appro approval for the ESSER grant. Uh, we're now working on the uh, en enrollment stability grant this week. We're putting the budget together for that and it will be submitted by Friday. And then uh, we're going to start looking at projects. Uh, this is a reimbursement account and we get 75% of the amount uh, for the the items that are qualified uh, for the FEMA grant. So it, it's open, so it's as needed. So it's basically the relief valve, if you will, for expenditures after uh, we load up the, the ESSER grant and the ESG. Very good. Um, this isn't really an issue. Just if we approve this, can we change my name from board president to board president? We're just missing some R's in the certification. Oh, just, sure. It's just a spelling error. Sure. I was just mentioning that. I, I don't have any questions. Any other questions or comments? Okay, we have a motion and a second to, to approve the item as presented. Member Rich. Aye. Uh, I'm an aye. Hatcher? Aye. Busby? Aye. Brown? Aye. Oh, okay, item 4.2, consideration of the Maricopa County Department of Public Health, MCDPH, metrics for a safe to return to in-person school. I'm going to assume that we have comments. Is that correct, Ms. Gatto? 
Yes, President Hill. How many? We have 149 comments, President Hill. Okay, so um, based on that, uh, for one, I'm letting the board know that as soon as we are done with public comments, we are gonna take a five minute break because we're gonna be here a while. Um, for policy BEDH, public participation at board meetings, um, there are some guidelines given to me as president. Um, under item C, if considered necessary, the president shall set a time limit on the length of the comment period. In order to ensure that each individual has an opportunity to address the board, the president may also set a time limit for individual speakers. I'm gonna consider this necessary. Um, due to the number of comments, I feel though that every comment has a right to be heard. However, I'm going to limit it to a one minute time frame instead of three, in order that this is going to be several hours of comments even at the one minute mark, but because um, I don't want to limit anyone's ability to have their voices heard, I am gonna limit to one minute, which is my prerogative as president. So my advice to those reading is um, read quickly. I mean, read well, but read quickly. And then when you hit the minute mark, please finish the sentence. Let us know that we've hit the minute and we'll move on. Uh, for those of us that are listening to the comments, um, please turn off, mute your, your microphones so um, we don't have any uh, paper rustling and stuff like that. So with that being said, um, let's go with the comments. Everyone else mute, please. Okay, the first comment is from Jalen Smith of Scottsdale. I would like to let you know that our family is 100% in favor of keeping the school reopening date with that was originally set for September 8th. We have two senior boys at Cactus Shadows, one biological and one foster child. As a CCUSD family, we are in agreement with the CDC, the Academy of Pediatrics and the Arizona Department of Child Safety in their call for in-person classes. As a foster family, we join the director of the Arizona Department of Child Safety, Mike Faust, in the belief that children and youth are seeking normalcy and children benefit from the engagement associated with traditional learning formats. Despite the best efforts made by CCUSD for online learning, it is a poor replacement for learning and intervention that takes place in a traditional classroom. Through the blessing of sharing our lives with our foster son, we know how crucial of a role teachers and schools have played in his life, often being the only stability he had along the way. The impact of teachers in the classroom cannot be denied in the life of our foster son and the lives of other vulnerable children. We are grieving with the thought of how many children are missing the stability and possibility life-saving intervention right now. Reopening the schools for in-person learning is what is best for our children and reopening on the date as promised further demonstrates the district's commitment to honor their word to families and to best serve the community's children. The next comment is from Molly Gum of Cave Creek. I'm a CCUSD teacher who is dedicated to my students and puts my heart and soul into educating and supporting them. Teaching is my calling and there is nowhere else I'd rather be than in Cactus Shadows classroom with my students. That being said, it is my belief that it is not safe to do so at this time. According to the Academy of Pediatrics, Arizona has the highest rate of pediatric COVID cases in the country. Arizona was able to keep its cases down while stay at home measures were in place. Within two weeks of rolling back those measures, cases exploded and we reached an upwards of 5,000 cases in a single day at our worst. Cases declined again when some measures were put back in place. Sending students back to packed classrooms, especially at the high school, will most likely lead to another surge in cases. This is already happening at high schools and universities across the country. Why would Cactus Shadows be any different? Students are shoulder to shoulder during passing period and classroom size do not allow for adequate distancing when there are 35 students to a class. The district has stated that it does not have the finances or means to enact social distancing measures. The high school is at even greater risk due to a large student body. High school teachers have more than 200 students circulating through their rooms each day. A student or teacher that gets COVID will result in a mandatory 10 day quarantine that will disrupt classroom instruction on both ends. How is that sustainable? How will we have enough subs to compensate? How will we make up for 10 days of lost instruction? How will students make up 10 days of lost instruction on all their classes? It'll be a disaster. Lives are at stake here. The safety of our students, teachers, and community is at stake here. We all want to be back in school. And while virtual learning is not ideal, human lives must be the priority. Please choose the following. Please choose to follow the metrics rather than arbitrarily opening on September 8th. No. 
the next comment, I'm sorry, President Hill, we're having a timer uh, issue. The next um, comment is from Shannon Canales of Cave Creek. The argument stating that we need to worry about 67 other zip codes before reopening our district was not the intent of the matrix, matrix outlined in MCDPH or AZDHS. The matrix states recommendations for individual districts based on the marks for that district and that district alone. CCUSD currently meets green in two of the three benchmarks with the final benchmark within reach. The rate of cases per 100 people dropped in half from the week prior reading and projections only show it to continue to decline at the same rate going forward. Schools need to reopen. Some children families have already chosen to continue with virtual learning. So the fear of the classroom crowding at CSHS will be misplaced. The whole valley is looking better. Nurses are being canceled from their shifts again for low census. And we have to shut down the COVID plus only units at the valley hospitals and replace them with mixed units once again. We need to get some normalcy back for our children. Not reopening schools for a hybrid option would be based on irrational, emotional driven decision making and not science. That's the end of that comment. The next comment is from Chris Fiesel, Scottsdale. It is time for the students to go back to school. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC guidelines support students returning to school and the Maricopa County metrics for safe return are close enough to support this as well. Our children need to be present in school with their teachers and friends. While online learning this fall has been much better than whatever it was we got in the spring, nothing compares to in-person learning. The students miss interacting with their teachers and playing with their friends and need to get back into school to make up for whatever lost learning they missed on while being away. My third grader went to six weeks of camp this summer. The students there wore masks, washed hands, and everyone followed the guidelines. There were no reported outbreaks. The same can be done in the schools. We are informed and believe that the teachers have been back at school doing the remote learning from some time now with no outbreaks. There is no reason to keep the students home anymore. All of us parents are requesting our children are allowed back in the classroom on September 8th. That includes that concludes that comment. The next comment is from Chris and Miriam Walker of Cave Creek. As a parent highly engaged in the lives of families and students on all levels here in Cave Creek, I write to you to hear both my family's perspective and families we spend time with often. We recognize the efforts you have made on behalf of our district. We understand it is a thankless job and you've stayed the course. We felt it is important why we share, why we believe schools should open as planned on September 8th. Our children need your advocacy, their physical, mental, and social health matter in times like these even more so. And so it's the freedom of choice for our children I'd like to focus on. Since March, the only group that has been denied their freedom locked up in an online world with no real interaction or learning from a classroom setting has been our children. Fear overpowered educational best practices. Research proves active interaction is necessary. Teachers are heroes to our children. As an educator, both myself and my wife, we recognize teachers needed for a time remote education and that season has passed. Teachers and parents alike are out in the public at restaurants, golfing and exercising. That is time on that comment. <clears throat> the next comment is from Catherine Reeve of Scottsdale. As a parent of a CCUSD student and a very eager soon to be pre-K student who will also go to a CCUSD school, I cannot express enough my desire for my kids to get into their classroom. Our online model is a good temporary solution and I applaud the district admin and our amazing teachers for pulling this together. I want my kids in school as I work from home and it is nearly impossible right now. My kids need to be in school because they aren't doing as well at this format. However, we cannot return to school hastily just because of these reasons. I do not support our children and teachers being guinea pigs for this public health experiment and cannot imagine a worse situation than finally getting kids back into their classrooms only to close again. As schools across this country and state reopen, we are seeing mixed results. And I, I cannot put my kids through the heartbreak of having to leave school again because we rushed our return. While metrics suggest things are on the right path, we have seen before how relaxing too soon only leads to much worse outcome. I want my kids back in school. That's the end of time for that comment. <clears throat> the next comment is from Jennifer Warner of Scottsdale. Dear board and community, as a CCUSD parent, a former critical care nurse for 10 years and a present anesthesia provider for the past 15 years, I write to you with what I have learned over the past several months, the suggestions for safe reopening, I will write in bullet points for the sake of time. 
The virus is unlike any we have dealt with in recent history with potentially life long lasting effects that are not yet understood. Anyone at any age can become critically ill very quickly. As we all know, it does not affect children as severe or as often. They, they are carriers and can infect others around them while being asymptomatic. Many people with coexisting illnesses cannot risk being infected. The virus is going to be present circulating throughout the world indefinitely, and we need to find ways to mitigate its effects by limiting its spread in our community. Harvard University has done extensive research and has come up, come up with reasonable questions that should be answered prior to returning in person. Please consider a public answer to most of these prior in return. That is the time on that comment. Next comment is from Steve and Tonya Sweeney of Cave Creek. I'm a concerned parent with two children in CCUSD. It is imperative they return to school starting September 8th for the following reasons. Classroom instruction is a time proven method for children's learning, socialization, and long term mental and physical health. Where are the studies that prove your current teaching method is effective? Please cite references. What professional medical associations will you base your decision on? Name them. Keeping my kids focused on a Zoom classroom session is getting more difficult each day. Kids are easily distracted, making learning more difficult. The curriculum is substandard, which I assume was done to fit into a, quote, one size fits all, end quote, Zoom situation. Socialization, including playing with peers, is extremely important, and they are getting none under the current circumstances. Do you know you are not doing long-term harm to our kids by not allowing them back into the classroom? If you decide not to return to school, are you doing what's best for the children or listening to the teachers union? Be specific, cite references. If the board decides to continue keeping classrooms closed, that is time on that comment. The next comment is from E.B. Eichmann of Scottsdale. Dear Superintendent Burdick and board members, I'm a parent of a fourth grader who is concerned about CCUSD's reopening plans. I am writing to ask you to prioritize some form of reopening school buildings rather than all remote learning. The importance of in-person learning is outlined on CDC's website. Quote, aside from a child's home, no other setting has more influence on a child's health and well-being than their school. The in-person school environment does the following, provides educational instruction, supports the development of social and emotional skills, creates a safe environment for learning, addresses nutritional needs, and facilitates physical activity, end quote. Quote, COVID-19 and children, the best available evidence indicates that COVID-19 poses relatively low risks to school-aged children. Children appear to be at lower risk for contracting COVID-19 compared to adults, end quote. Quote, educational instruction, extended school closure is harmful to children. It can lead to severe learning loss and the need for in-person instruction is particularly important for students with heightened behavioral needs. That's time on that comment. The next comment is from Kelly Demos of Scottsdale. In reference to item 4.2 on the board agenda 831, I have appreciated the hard work and dedication of teachers and staff to provide distance learning to our students. I am fortunate and have very bright, disciplined and dedicated children and have really had no involvement in their schoolwork during this time. However, just like all of us, the situation is finally beginning to take a toll on them mentally. They are more introverted and the Zoom platform makes them feel like the center of attention and put on the spot. They miss their friends and even the opportunity to interact with teachers. I have a senior and an eighth grader. My senior has missed out on being able to interact with teachers that would help those writing letters of recommendations have a better understanding of who he is as a student and person. As a senior, he has had so many other roadblocks occur during this time, testing school visits, recruiting opportunities. I, it would help tremendously to have the support of teachers, staff and friends, which doing from a distance is very uncomfortable for him. My eighth grader has been a severe asthmatic most of his life, but, and that is time on that comment. Dr. Burdick will read the next 10 comments, President Hill. The first comment is from Blair Roberts from Cave Creek. My name is Blair Roberts. I have been a mother in the Cave Creek Unified School District for 11 years. My children have been to Desert Willow, Snoring Trails, and now Cactus Shadows. I am frustrated with the outcome of this online schooling. A few weeks in, I had to write the principal of Cactus Shadows, asking them if four to eight minutes of class time was okay for the online protocol of class. 
In one week, my 11th grader son had three classes, no teacher, no subs, and then another teacher decided it was a good time to drive her son to school during her teaching time, gave the kids a packet and logged out. The next day she logged in for eight minutes, gave the kids some work and told them if they needed help, they could form a group to help each other after class. I posted this on our three community bulletin boards to see if anyone else was having this problem. And by the comments, there were many. The next comment is from Jocelyn Haddock of Cave Creek. First, of, first I would like to thank CCUSD 93 administration and staff for working tirelessly to provide Cave Creek children with virtual learning. The hard work out into creating the online platform exceeded our family's expectations. That being said, our kids still need to be physically in the classroom. I have a 10th grade student at Cactus Shadows, and as I type this, she has spent nearly seven hours in her room staring at a screen. My daughter is lucky that I can adjust my working hours to make sure she eats, stretches, and more importantly, doesn't feel alone. Many working parents aren't as fortunate and their children are left alone for hours unattended. Even as high school students are more self-sufficient, they still need guidance. For some, the school campus is their only lifeline for social interaction and a decent meal during the day. When the pandemic started, businesses and people were labeled essential or non-essential. I was deemed non-essential and my husband deemed essential. We were grateful that my husband's business that employs nearly 200 people could keep operating, even with the knowledge that our exposure to COVID-19 would be greater. As soon as the lockdown lifted, I went back to work as a hairdresser and that is time for that comment. The next comment is from Laura Trusino from Scottsdale. We have three children in the Cave Creek Unified School District and are highly opposed for pushing back the start date for in-person learning. Our children have felt the side effects of distancing for almost six months now, and we as a district need to recognize the mental health effect it's having on our kids. Children do not have the same coping mechanisms and understanding we do as adults to successfully handle this amount of social disconnect from their peers. Moreover, while we believe that CCUSD teachers are performing to the best of their abilities with distance learning platforms, the fact is that there is another large disconnect occurring from not being physically in the classroom. The invaluable teacher-student relationships that should have already had a solid foundation at this point in the school year cannot be formed as they would be from behind computer screens. Additionally, the distractions of a learn from home environment are costing the kids valuable learning time that cannot be made up. So the sooner the students are back in a classroom setting, the better off they will be. We have faith in CCUSD, the precautions have been put in place to the best of their ability. That is the end of time for that comment. The next comment is from Bill Kaiser from Cave Creek. Parents and kids want school to start on September 8th. These kids need to be in school in person. There's no good reason not to. The next comment is from Chris Hazeltine from Cave Creek. Dear President Hill, Governing Board members, and Dr. Burdick, I utterly understand the weight of decisions that you are bearing with regard to opening our district schools. I know that you are taking every consideration seriously as you debate this issue with yourselves and amongst each other. I ask in your deliberations that you take into consideration several factors that as a veteran teacher of CCUSD, I feel are important and worthy of thought. Please consider what we have seen nationally with school districts that open prematurely for face-to-face -face instruction, only to be summarily shut down due to viral outbreaks. Namely, consider the schools in Georgia, Mississippi, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Indiana. Furthermore, please consider rigidly adhering to the DOH metric requirements recommended by Governor Ducey, specifically that we as a school district are green in all three metrics for 14 consecutive days before determining that it is safe for students and staff to return to school. Finally, I strongly urge you to extend the return to school day from September 8th until it's safe to return again as determined by being green. That is the end of time. The next comment is from Lucille Forall and from Scottsdale. Hello, I would like to urge the board to keep the date of return to school in person to September 8th, 2020 as scheduled. In a nutshell, children need in-person instruction. They need the structure of a school schedule. They need to learn from their teachers other than just via Zoom. They also need the social benefits and physical activities that school offers. Even the CDC wrote in an article about the importance of reopening America's schools this fall. 
on July 27, 2020, available on their website. I trust that my daughter's school, Desert Sun Academy, will follow protocols to keep students and teachers as safe as they possibly can. I understand that there will be risks involved with sending my kids to in-person school, but I am willing to take these risks. Other families are worried about going back to school in person for health or personal reasons, which I respect. They can opt for online instruction. In addition to the fact that I believe children need in-person instruction, I am a single working mother. It has been very challenging, and that is the end of time for that comment. Next is Patricia, Patricia Miller of Cave Creek. My husband and I have two kids enrolled in CCUSD. As parents who have supported our schools, it is becoming more and more disheartening to see that our kids are getting mixed up in the politics of opening up our schools. Many of us parents want what is best for the kids and don't have other agendas. Please consider putting politics aside and working in the best interests of our community and kids. Now that the numbers are similar to what they were just before the schools closed in March, I believe parents should have a choice. The numbers will never be zero. It will be impossible in many ways to reach green level for all three categories, cases, positivity, and COVID-like illness. From what I have read, the guidelines for these benchmarks are a two-week decline in average cases or less than 10 per 100,000. This is an either or, which means we're currently on the border of entering green for cases. Life must go on eventually, and these are guidelines, not mandates. The district has to make some decisions. And since we are at minimal community spread in and around CCUSD and schools are essential, it is time to get prepared for a safe reopening. That is time on that comment. The next comment is from Valerie White of Scottsdale. How long can we continue to hide from a virus that is here to stay? Let families choose for themselves, allowing those who have personal health concerns to learn remotely from home while allowing those that chose in-person learning to return to the classroom. I have two kids at Cactus Shadows High School. We certainly have our struggles with online learning. This is definitely not an ideal situation for focused learning, making the grades or preparing them for college. Our kids need the classroom and peer interaction. They sit on computer screens all day long, only to have to stare at their screens a few hours more to attempt their homework. Queen Creek Schools, Scottsdale Christian Academy, American Leadership Academy, and some great heart schools have already opened successfully. Businesses, gyms, including our local YMCA up the street, restaurants, and even bars have opened. The YMCA has been open to children this entire time since March successfully. Kids are at the lowest risk. How much longer do we have to hide from a virus that is here to stay? What are we waiting for? Next is from Emily Petty from Cave Creek. Thank you for addressing public comments on the issue of how and when to safely reopen schools. I would like to urge the board to commit to following the benchmarks put out by Maricopa County Department of Health when they make the crucial decision about when to send CCUSD kids and teachers back to the classroom, just as all of the bordering school districts have done. Many CCUSD families and teachers live beyond the district borders, and so that factor must also be taken into consideration when deciding when and how to reopen. Deer Valley has stated that the earliest date they'll begin in-person instruction would be October 5th. Deer Valley has also explored hybrid options and a staggered start date by grade, which I would encourage CCUSD to look into as well in order to serve those children most at risk as soon as possible. Paradise Valley says the earliest return to in-person learning would be early to mid-October. We have also committed to providing families and staff with transition time before moving to in-person learning. Scottsdale has committed to adhering to county metrics. That is the end of time for that comment. The next comment is from Christina Scott of Scottsdale. I am the parent of an eighth grader at Snorin Trails and a third grader at Horseshoe Trails. After witnessing and working with Canvas and Zoom for several weeks of virtual school, it is clearly in the best interests of the children that in-person school resumes on September 8th. Our district has had adequate time to prepare for return to school over the last five months. There is no reason this should not happen. Virtual school does not work for a third grader and it is not an adequate school replacement for any student of any age. My third grader is completely unable to focus on the pre-recorded videos and Zooms and has been brought to tears multiple times over the mundane cycle of Zoom meetings and online assignments. He cannot manage the computer programs and work on his own, which means that I am unable to attend to my job and has impacted our family. 
I could not simply drop him off at a child care center where he could do his work on his own as he is young and on an IEP, as are many of his third grade friends at Horseshoe Trails. I spend the entire morning, and that is the end of that comment, and the next comments will come from Dr. Pratt. All right, the next comment is from Elizabeth Ehrlich from Cave Creek. Let our children start in-person learning on September 8th, 2020. The district offered two learning options, online learning or distance learning, moving back to in-person. Those who chose <clears throat> distance want our children in person. If you wait till October 12th as recommended by Superintendent Burdick and the metrics, and the metrics are not green, 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 then what? Delay further, rip the Band-Aid off and start in person in September. Kicking this can down the road doesn't solve anything. It just frustrates parents who want or need their child back in school. These parents who enrolled their child in distance and are not ready for in-person can transition their child to online. Don't force the rest of us to continue with this distance crap. Listen to us, parents of CCOSD distance learning students. This is who you need to represent when you are voting, not the community at large, not Superintendent Burdick. So, uh, represent us, the parents that voted for you and have chosen to keep our kids in CCUSD brick and mortar. That's the end of that time. The next comment is from Christy Pine from Cave Creek. Dear Debbie, my first and fondest memory of you is from the morning my husband died. My son still wanted to go to his kinder Thanksgiving performance at LMES, so I went as well. There was an awkward silence around me, but you came right up, gave me a big hug and your condolences. Many times throughout these past nine years, I've wanted to call you about a teacher or a principal or something I just didn't think was right. But then I would think about how busy you must be and that you have over 2000 other families you are dealing with. So I wouldn't bother you. I can no longer stay silent, however. What are you going to do? What you are about to do is wrong. Not sending these kids back to school is just wrong. I could talk about the statistics and the numbers, which many are currently being questioned as to their authenticity. I could remind you that over 80% of your constituents voted to go back to on site learning, but you know that as well. So I will tell you about my personal experience instead. My son sits like a zombie in front of his computer all day as teachers struggle with the technology, struggle with getting attendance right. And that's the end of time on that comment. The next comment is from Maribel Pine from Cave Creek. Dear CCUSD parents, teachers, students, staff, and more, as you are blatantly aware, our community has, as well as communities globally, are currently being affected by COVID-19 pandemic. As a student of Cactus Shadows High School and a citizen of Cave Creek, my life as well as the lives around me have been affected tremendously. And it's time that we as a community come together and face the real issues that are occurring due to this disease. I firmly believe that this outbreak has been purely motivated by political ideology and not genuine concern, genuine concern for the public's health and safety. I believe this is this because I've done my own research on the topic countless times, finding and pr processing new information that consistently contradicts itself. Uh, on countless on uh, one side of the political spectrum, there's news sources that post headlines and articles to instill incite fear in its readers instead of informing the public of what's really happening in our country. Within other sources, I've found real facts from real doctors and hundreds of statements, and that's the end of time on that one. The next comment is from uh, Helene Raphael from Cave Creek. As a parent of two children in the district, I'm writing you with the greatest admiration of, for the leadership that you have shown. You have given parents choice of education in this crisis. I implore you to continue that leadership by using the data, science, and research as your own guideline, as your guideline. We are ready to reopen our district on September 8th. All the data shows this. The Maricopa County dashboard has us at the hybrid approved level since early August. This is a guideline that we have met for weeks now. We must take the recommendations by several well-known organizations that in-person learning provides mental, social, and physical benefits for the children, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, CDC, and others. The future of our children's well-being is at stake. Our governor is boasting the lowest per person infection rate in the nation. I hope that you make this choice without any further delay and put Cave Creek on the national map for its thought leadership. That's the end of that comment. The next comment is from Lisa Stevenson from uh, Scottsdale. Hi board, 
please let our kiddos return. I have two high schoolers and they need to be with their friends and learning in person from their wonderful hardworking teachers. Numbers are down and, every, and everywhere is opening. If all are allowed to go to the movies outside school, club sports, shopping, restaurants, and gyms, then school return is a must. After all, school is more important than all of these. My kids have always enjoyed going to school. I'm worried that if they continue to stay home for too long, they are going to lose their desire to to even want to go, and that would be the saddest outcome of all. Thank you all so much for your hard work and dedication to CCUSD. I know that this is a difficult decision to be forced to make, Lisa Stevenson. That's the end of that comment. The next comment is from Dawn um, Carancy from, from Cave Creek. Schools must open. Our kids are going to be so far behind academically and socially from something that doesn't even have an effect on our kids. Please open our schools. That's the end of that comment. The next comment is from Giovanni Caranzi, Cave Creek. Our, open our schools. The damage we are doing to our children is real and a much bigger threat than COVID ever was or will be. What are we doing? If we are supposed to listen to or go by the science, then we know this is not something that is a problem for kids. Open our schools. That's the end of that comment. The next comment is from Matt Milinovich from Cave Creek. Please do not push back the reopening date any further. The well-being of our students is at risk. We do not have to be at green, green, green to open. Guidelines on the MCDPH website, as noted below, are clearly written and noted. According to MCDPH recommendations for resuming in-person learning, we need, and then it's numbered, number one, two consecutive weeks with new case rates below 100 per 100,000 people. CCUSD area has met this for two weeks. Two, two consecutive weeks that with less than 7% positivity, CCUSD area has met this for two weeks. Three, two consecutive weeks with percent of hospital visits showing symptoms of COVID-like illness below 10%. CCUSD area has met this for two weeks. Our students have suffered long enough and need to be in a more traditional learning environment or they will fall even further behind. We are doing so much harm to them by keeping them behind computer screens instead of in our classrooms. You have no idea, and that's the end of time for that one. The next comment is from Marta McBann from Cave Creek. To, the, to superintendents and board members of CCUSD, I encourage you to open schools in CCUSD. The way learning is happening present, presently is not learning and is not what is best for our children. I, uh, I'm sure that you have seen the countless uh, stories around the country of children of all ages in tears, frustration, sitting in front of screens for six hours a day, no social interactions, etc. Stress and depression have spiked. The evidence of this is readily available online and not hard to find. As for the threat of COVID-19, the virus is known to have a 99% recovery rate. It should not be more feared than the annual flu, pneumonia, or other similar illnesses that our schools see each year. If it is safe enough for schools to be open as learning centers for daycare to be open, for classes such as dance, gymnastics, et cetera, et cetera, to be open, movie theaters, churches, and other businesses are open, therefore schools should be open as well. If the educators in our district, along with the board and other staff, truly care about the well being, and that's uh, the end of that comment. The next comment is from Ashlyn Castellic from Cave Creek. Hello, I am a student at at CSHS, and I would really like to go back to in-person school September 8th. I know that all my friends would agree with me that they learn way better in person with a live teacher. Online, there are a ton of distractions, and the communication of the lesson is always confusing. As developing young adults, we need the social interactions to develop who we are that virtual school can't offer. I hope at your next meeting, you decide to keep the reopening date you previously planned on September 8th. And that's the end of that comment. And that's the end of those, that group. The next comment is from Joni Ragusa of Cave Creek. We all can agree that in-person education is the most desirable platform for our children to learn, but you must ask yourselves at what cost. Science explains that close proximity and extended periods of time are the two greatest factors in the spread of the COVID-19 virus. These two factors are the definition of the school setting. A spray bottle of disinfectant and a mask does not make a school sa a safe school. Our public libraries are not open to the public. The Phoenix Art Museum remains closed to the public. 
There are no walk-in service at most of our county offices included, but not limited to motor vehicle department. No matter how much we want to return to the classroom, it's simply not safe for our children and staff. I believe it would be best to err on the side of safety and health, keep virtual learning for the first semester and then reevaluate. Thank you. The next comment is from Richard Bradford of Phoenix. In response to the motion that in-person school should be delayed, I have several thoughts for you to consider. I have two grandsons that are in an immersion program that need to be in person in order for them to be successful. These programs are designed around community and peer interaction. As a working grandparent, I'm trying to help my grandchildren with online schooling so my daughter can work. I have been through a lot in my life between war, hardships, et cetera, and having schools closed seems ridiculous to me. If grocery stores, gyms, movie theaters, et cetera, can be reopened, there is no reason schools not to open. I see the mental and emotional toll having schools closed is having on my daughter's family. My grandsons have become withdrawn, argumentative, anxious, to name a few. These children need peers and teachers to thrive. Please consider allowing the children that want to return come back. Thank you for your time. The next comment is from the Wurstler family in Rio Verde. We want to return students to in-person schooling without further delay. Remote instruction is not an adequate substitute and the long-term consequences to our children's education are detrimental. We have the choice to continue harming their future by forcing remote learning. We should have the wisdom to allow each family to make their own choice about what is best for their situation. That choice must include in-person education. That's the end of that comment. The next comment is from Naomi Castellic. I just want to, uh, Cave Creek, I just want to express my full support of the kids returning to in-person school on September 8th. That's the end of that comment. Next comment is from Chris Olson of Cave Creek. I wish to express my concern for the well-being of our children if they are not allowed to return to in-person school. I think it is imperative that children that want to return to school are allowed to as soon as possible. We can see that for every day that passes with our kids attending school online, our children's scholastic ability declines and will take significant effort to return to the levels they were at before the school shutdowns. They also need the social interaction for their mental health. I understand the concerns by administrators, faculty, and parents. However, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Please vote to return to in-person schooling right now. Thank you for your consideration. That's the end of that comment. Next comment is from Edna. Annette Melton of Scottsdale. I would like to express my desire to have my grandchildren return to in-person schooling. I have been helping with schoolwork so that my children can continue to work as my son is a first responder. I would like to let you know that I have noticed in my two grandsons that are enrolled in the immersion program with CCUSD. They have become withdrawn at times, frustrated with trying to get into classes and submit assignments, as well as becoming argumentative. This, in no way, this is no way for children to go through school I am 86 years old and have never witnessed our country in this state. I am cons considered in one of the high demographics to contract COVID-19. However, I am still continuing to help children. Trust me when I say you cannot live in fear. These children must be allowed to return for their well-being. Thank you for your time. Next comment is from Amy Rudy of Scottsdale. I have four children in CCUSD who attend Cactus Shadows, Sonoran Trails, and Horseshoe Trails. I am also an art teacher at a private school in Phoenix. My school has been back in person for over two weeks now and masks are optional for students and teachers. As an art teacher, I do not just have one group of kids isolated in my classroom. I have all classes, kindergarten through eighth grade, sitting side by side at tables. I clean all the tables and chairs between each class that comes in. With all of the precautions I can take with art supplies and having a pencil box specific to each kid, one another daily, no masks. I have a junior, an eighth grader, a sixth grader, and a first grader. While our junior can handle online learning, I'm seeing the negatives with my other three they're experiencing. My first grader is in Mandarin immersion and it is clear to me that six-year-olds should not be expected to navigate Canvas, the other programs, or the internet solo and complete assignments alone. Because my husband works full-time and my other kids, and that is time on that comment. The next comment is from Christy Thomas of Cave Creek. We are deeply concerned to read in the board book this weekend that there is a possibility of a motion to move the stay at home online learning from September 8th to October 12th. We have lived in Cave Creek for over 16 years and have two children in the CCUSD system. They have grown up in the system through Lone Mountain and one is now at Sonoran Trails and are actively involved in their academics and activities at their schools. I've been involved as a volunteer on the Lone Mountain PTO 
endless hours of volunteering in the classroom and other activities, and the huge support of all CCUSD has stood for. The news we have this weekend is extremely disheartening and disappointing. In July, all CCUSD families were given a choice for what would work best for their family. Option one, option two, an Academy of Excellence. Soon after, the, the board voted to extend the date for in-person from August 17th per the governor for approval to return in-person to September 8th by a 3-2, quote, in favor to extend, end quote, vote. And yes, we sat there for the board meeting and watched it on YouTube, keeping in mind that, again, we had been presented with a choice. That is the uh, time on that comment. The next comment is from Allison Summer of Cave Creek. Cave Creek School should not open up on September 8th. It is not safe for our schools to open at this time. We have not had a single week with benchmarks completely green, and we also need to take into consideration the large amount of students and employees who live outside our district. With September 8th being on only two weeks away, it is not appropriate to open. Opening the schools too soon, September 8th is too soon, will create further instability for our children due to inevitable quarantines of classrooms and closures due to COVID infection, causing our children to bounce back and forth between online learning and classroom learning. This is unacceptable for our children and for our teachers. The next comment is from Lori Hart, Cave Creek. Dear Dr. Burdick and governing board members, on August 10th, you received a letter signed by 125 teachers in our district asking you to use science to make the decision about when to safely return to school. Today, you will be making that decision, and I again urge you to please let the experts guide you. The state recommends waiting to reopen until all three health metrics have gone for 14 consecutive days green, and the Arizona Physicians and Educators COVID Task Force we referenced in our letter two weeks ago state there is a minimum requirement. In particular, this group suggested a 28-day period with consistent downward trajectory rather than only 14 days, and also adequate testing availability with rapid turnaround results, adequate PPE supplies for all educators and staff, widespread contact tasting, and staggering the return to school by grade levels. As you make this important decision, please also consider that the state has just this week started reopening bars, theaters, and gyms, <coughs> Excuse me. And we do not at this moment understand the ramifications of that opening. That's time on that um, comment and Dr. Burdick will take the next round. This first comment is from Jonathan Benjamin of Cave Creek. When time gives you a retrospective look back at a moment when a decision had to be made being in the middle of the bell curve of issues represents the safe zone. Surgeons who look at new technologies and concepts love that middle of the curve because it protects their patients and protects themselves. Why would CCUSD want to be the first local public school to return to in-person instruction ahead of other school districts and counter to guidelines put forth to protect the community at large? I say follow the science and listen to the recommendations. Look at the universities backpedaling and reversing course. Kids will not wear masks and distance 100% of the time and the six foot distancing and testing required. I think any rational person knows that our schools can't provide that part of the trio of COVID-19 mitigation. I see, say this as a tenured science teacher who fully knows that distance learning is compromised and kids need social interaction. Please be patient follow our data to improve and follow local actions related to resuming in-person instruction. This patients will protect our community and that's the time on that comment. The next comment is from Melissa Laudenschlager of Cave Creek. I would like to express my strong desire for my child to return to in-person learning on September 8th as currently set forth by CCUSD per the requirements provided by Governor Ducey. We have met these requirements at CCUSD. We have been diligent in following his guidance since the start of this pandemic. Why waver now? We have already pushed to reopen schools until September 8th as a precaution when the governor stated public schools could reopen August 17th. Arizona case numbers have been on a significant decline in the past couple of weeks and our rate of spread has been the lowest, if not one of the lowest, in as many weeks. Our kids need to be with their peers. Continuing to prolong will only cause more long-term detriment and catastrophic psychological issues for our kids. Are we considering a hybrid option to allow teachers, students, and parents to feel safe? I work in the healthcare industry and also was a victim of COVID myself. My case, like 99% of others, was not life-threatening and was very mild. And that is the end of that comment. 
The next comment is, sorry, that was time for that comment. Next is Stacy Karras from Phoenix. President Hill, Vice President Rich, members of the governing board, Superintendent Burdick, colleagues, parents, and staff. My name is Stacy Karras and I am a PE teacher at Cactus Shadows High School. I have been in the district for five years. Before addressing my specific comments regarding this decision to remain virtual or return physically to campus, I want to convey my appreciation for the opportunity to provide not only my thoughts on this, but also share that in my 23 years of teaching, I have never experienced such an internal conflict as I find myself in today. I do not envy your deliberations or the consequences. No matter what you decide uh, will be welcomed by some, discounted by others, and feared by others. For me, I'm in the group that is scared. I'm fearful of what ramifications that will eat away at my confidence and focusing on safety protocols to such a degree that they, the very purpose of my teaching physical education will be lost. I don't know how I ever could live with myself if I learned that one of my students came down with the virus because of some safety protocol I missed. And that is time on that comment. The next comment is from Jacob Schwartz from Cave Creek. Our children need to return to in school learning. We believe it is safe to return to school for both students and teachers alike. The statistics listed on the MCDPH website show only one narrow part of the overall analysis. I would like to understand if the board has also considered the metrics and statistics of the increased levels of depression, anxiety, suicide, and suicidal thoughts in our children since being forced into this continued isolation. In addition to the emotional and mental health damages being caused, caused here, there are also academic damages. I'm extremely disappointed in the online learning, and I believe the only way for my children to begin effectively learning again is to return to school. My children all feel the same way. They want to return to school. More than maybe ever before, this board has the ability to help our children. Please do not hide behind statistics and fear. Bring these kids back to school immediately. Get them socializing again, learning again, and living their lives again. The next comment is from Jackson Scott of Scottsdale. My name is Jackson and I am in third grade. I miss my teachers and my friends. I hate online school. It makes me sad. Please let us go back. The next comment is from Jason Mays from Scottsdale. Good evening. The purpose of this comment is to strongly urge all decision makers to reject any further delays into opening CCUSD schools. Politics need to be entirely disregarded with only objective data and information worthy of consideration when making this decision. The count of cases and deaths per day have not just flattened, but have just about crashed to zero and are currently well below 10% of the pandemic's early to mid-July peaks, as reported by the Arizona Department of Health Services. Should a case arise, it has also been established that children are more resilient in this disease than even the common flu. Put in simply in terms of risk analysis, low incidence times little risk per incident equals back to school. It has been our observation that many teachers currently advocate much of their responsibility by commonly availing themselves to lectures and questions for less than half of the scheduled class time. This is not going unnoticed in the community. Accredited organizations, including the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, American Academy of Pediatrics, and that is time on that comment. The next comment is from Stephanie Liberatore, and uh, she is in Scottsdale. To begin, I would like to thank district teachers, staff, and administrators for doing an amazing job with distance learning. I have a child with an IEP, and I have been so thankful for the services provided during this time. I'm asking that the board members vote to follow the Arizona Department of Health Services recommended metrics for the safe opening of school, which is to wait on in-person learning until all three metrics are in the green and have stayed there for a two-week period. It's important that you listen to the professionals and use data when making the decision. How does returning to in-person school when, when Maricopa County has not met these metrics ensure a safe and successful learning experience for our children? I am sure there has not been such an important decision made by a school board in many years, if ever. We cannot afford to get this one wrong. The health of staff, students, and families depend on your vote. If there is a time to be cautious, it's now. I believe if we wait to open schools, when metrics are met, school is more likely to stay open and students and teachers will not have to bounce back and forth between home and school. That is time for that comment. The next comment is from Shauna Melton. In response to the motion, I'm sorry, from Cave Creek. In the response to the motion that in-person school be delayed, I have several thoughts for you to reconsider. 
we have two boys, second and fourth grade, that are enrolled in the immersion programs in the district. The entire premise and success of the program relies on the children being with peers in the classroom setting, not sitting and watching videos by themselves. We as parents agreed to the online distance learning in the short term as there was no other option. If in-person had been available to start, we would have done that. Unfortunately, parents and families as a whole are not being considered. We have done what the board has asked of us and yet you're considering pushing back the date again. I asked you to really think about the fact that if grocery stores and other retailers that are not controlled environments are open, why are the schools having an issue? Let those that chose to stay home do so and those that want what's best for children and families return back to school. As a first responder family, we know the risks and are completely comfortable with our children being in school setting. Our children's social, emotional, cognitive development and general well-being are more important. That is time on that comment. The next comment is by Pam Gum of Cave Creek. President Hill and members of the governing board, I'd like to begin by pointing out the irony in the situation. The school board is still meeting via Zoom because it is too much of a risk to meet in person. It is not difficult to social distance in the boardroom at the district office. It is, however, impossible to social distance and cease to USD classrooms, especially at the high school. Why is it that you are willing to risk our children and teachers being exposed to COVID, but you aren't willing to take that risk yourselves? Nobody disagrees with children learning better in the classroom, but when we're in a global pandemic, health and Human life must be the ultimate priority. As much as we want life to go back to normal, it can't right now, and pretending like it can is putting lives at risk. The pandemic isn't over just because we wish it was. Within 15 days of opening schools, Florida has already reported 9,000 new cases of COVID in school children. Arizona has one of the highest rates of pediatric COVID cases in the country. To think that it won't spread among children is naive and inaccurate. A family friend had a young child in Phoenix Children's Hospital for over a week with complications from COVID. He's five years old. That is the time for that comment. The next comment is from Maria Reine of Cave Creek. I want to thank the school board and Dr. Burdick for navigating our district through this unprecedented time and meeting the needs of our diverse community. While virtual learning at home continues, there are options for families who need in-person learning, allowing safe options for all. This is not a perfect situation for anyone. Luckily, our children are more resilient than we know. I am writing to request you extend virtual learning for our district. As you know, the state and our community have not met recommended guidelines for reopening schools. Yet at this time, our state leaders have decided to reopen other businesses, gyms, movie theaters, bars, water parks, as well as local college campuses that have reopened. Arizonans have seen the negative results of reopening the state too soon and all at once previously. I pray that we do not see the same results this time, but it does not make sense to put our children, teachers, and staff at risk. We do not need to be part of an experiment. We all agree classroom learning is best, but only when it is as safe as possible for all. We've observed districts bend to the pressure to reopen too soon just to have to close their doors. And that is time for that comment. Dr. Pratt will continue. The next comment is from Michelle Williams from Cave Creek. Dear Dr. Burdick, Dr. Miller, and the governing board members, I'm a parent in the district and have been since 2000. I'm reaching out to relay two comments and requests. One, please allow our children to return to the classroom setting on September 8th. Our metrics per the health department have been met to return in-person in learning. To deny opening our schools until all greens are met is unnecessary and extreme. In fact, with all greens, according to the Arizona Department of Health information, all greens list face coverings, not needed and no other restrictions on field trips and large gatherings. Additionally, the Maricopa site is about two to four weeks behind in data. So we likely have met all three. The metrics by the AZDHS are recommendations for uh, individual districts, not intended to factor in other surrounding zip codes. Also the RT per, uh, of um, Arizona is the lowest in the nation for the uh, very long time showing minimal spread. Clearly, that's the end of that comment for time. The next comment is from Jennifer Klaus from Cave Creek. Good evening, governing board members. This is a very important moment in our district's timeline. You, our elected board members, have the ability to send our children back to school. While almost every type of business, church, restaurant, bar, theater, movie theater, and sports are returning to the new norm with all sizes of staffing and customers, patrons, our students are still expected to stay home 
to earn their education. Where is the logic in this? The online learning system is not working for the vast majority of students and they will will admit that they are not learning. Ask them, or better yet, test them. The CDC has just released updated information that reveals that 6% of deaths in the US were patients who passed specifically from COVID. Over 3 million people have recovered from COVID. This is all good news. I realize the decision to return to school in in-person to in-person learning is not one an easy one. But rather than living <clears throat> in the what if, let's live in the we can allow those students who need and want to be in the classroom back and allow those who need to remain home continue their online learning that is the end of that comment for time the next comment is from chris <clears throat> excuse me fitzwater from cave creek that's it it's over the cdc just admittedly admitted only six percent of total deaths were actually caused directly by COVID 19. time to open the schools and get back to work the people and ch the children have had enough of the lies and political manipulation from all those involved if you vote to delay school, once again, you are accomplices in this lie. However, I would like to thank the three board members that voted to not open schools the first go around. The community has come together and become more organized since then. Our Facebook group started with 250 members and now has grown to 10,000. Not to mention you pushed a lot of people over into the Trump train, choo choo, mega 2020. That's the end of that comment. Next comment is from Jill McLinn from Cave Creek. Good evening, President Hill, Dr. Burdick, and governing board members. As a staff member, parent, and citizen of CCUSD, I urge you to follow the metrics requirements rec recommended by Governor Ducey. I would love nothing more than to be back at the classroom and have both my children in classrooms as well. At this time, though, I look around our country and see what's happening with to other schools and districts that have opened too early. According to the CDC, on August 27th, 2020, COVID-19 cases among U.S. children increased by 21% in just two weeks. I teach five classes a day. Three of my five classes have 30 or more students in each class. Social distancing can't happen in my classroom. Please consider that what we have seen in schools like Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, and, and Tennessee. More importantly, please consider to adhering to the metrics, specifically having them green for all 14 days, consecutive days. I can't wait to get back in person learning with my students but I would like to make sure that it's as safe as possible. That's the end of that comment. The next comment is from Debbie and John Pugh from Scottsdale. As grandparents of two children in the CCUSD, <clears throat> we feel the district would be doing a severe disservice to its children by not allowing in-class learning to resume on September 8th. We have become increasingly concerned for them, their parents and, their, and our overall community. The problems with online learning are numerous and grave and are already producing frustrated teachers and parents. As Maricopa County has now met the required benchmarks set by the Department of Health for reopening schools, it's time to properly evaluate the district, the diminished risks of COVID-19 versus the increasing risks of obtaining an appropriate level of learning that can only be achieved with in-school education. The undue burden being placed on parents further exacerbates, exacerbates the health of the children and the family unit. It's time to go back to school. And that is that end of that comment. The next comment is from Caitlin Thomas from Cave Creek. My name is Caitlin Thomas. I'm a sixth grade. I'm in sixth grade this year. My experience with online school has one pro and many cons. A pro is that we have a live virtual meeting for class, every class, including specials. So if we ever need anything, we can ask the teachers directly. The reason I want to go back to school on September 8th is because I miss the social part of school and being in person with my friends, classmates, and teachers. A few days ago, I got kicked off a class nine times. If we stay online longer, who knows how many more times I will get kicked out of my classes. If we were in-person learning, this would not be happening. We were given a choice if we wanted to go back in person to, to in-person school or stay online. Our family chose it was time to go back on September 8th. I would be very upset if the date is extended to October 12th. Even though I am a type one diabetic, I still feel safe returning to school on September 8th and my parents feel the same. Not being able to see my friends during the school day makes me feel lonely. People I would normally see on a typical school day, I now get to see sometimes on the weekends. And that's the end of time for that comment. The next comment is Dan Thomas, Cave Creek. Our children need to return to in-school learning now. It is currently considered safe enough for us to be able to take our children to a restaurant, to the gym, to the movie theaters, and to the grocery store, but you are considering not letting them go back to in-school learning because it's not safe enough yet, question mark. 
is, is currently considered <clears throat> safe enough for us to take our children to club sports practices and games, but you are con still considering not letting them go back to in school learning because it's not safe enough. While the rest of community and multiple other school districts are opening up, CCUSD is considering a green, green, green benchmark to allow kids to go back to in-person learning. Ludicrous. I wasn't so, it wasn't so long ago that CCUSD came up with two viable options for their adult parents to choose from. Which option they chose was based on what they felt was best for their child, not what was best for every child. I ask you, where did those options go? To be more precise, where did the option we chose, option one, go? And that's the end of time for that comment. The next comment is from Kevin Diamond from Cave Creek. Thank you to the majority of my kids' teachers that expressed their support to get back to in-person learning. Based on voting for the original delay on <clears throat> July 20th, a big July 20th, a big thank you goes out to the board members Busby and Brown for actually researching the topics and being proponents for in-person learning. At that time, we were ahead of their game. At, they were ahead of their game as COVID-19 cases and test positive rates were on the decline. It was very clear that other board members voted to push out in-person learning based on their feelings or the influence of minority of a minority of teachers. The board president complained about the lack of guidance from the Arizona state government. Well, anyone can lead when the trail is laid out via state mandates and metrics. Fortunately, our state government has empowered our school boards and administrators to make decisions that are best for the students while taking into account the Arizona COVID benchmark metrics. The overall COVID metrics are improving so dramatically that the Arizona state benchmark metrics will likely meet all thresholds by next week. That's the end of time for that comment. <clears throat> the next comment is from Summer Diaz from Cave Creek. <clears throat> Excuse me. After three weeks of online school, I'm writing to show my support for in-person classes to begin scheduled on September 8th. Families have been offered options. It is imperative that these options remain and finally now be truly made up available. Any families concerned about their own safety have the choice for online learning. My children are struggling with online learning. I need our choice, option one, to be honored and now offered. In-person teaching is irreplaceable, especially for rigorous classes. We are thankful for the skilled teachers in this district and look forward to learning in the classroom. And that is the end of that comment. John and Jill Robinson from Cave Creek. We are writing to comment that we are writing this comment to urge the board to please push back the in-person reopening school date to at least the end of first quarter in October. According to the MCDPA metrics, we should be in the green for at least two weeks before reopening our schools. We are currently still in the yellow and will not be in the green for, uh, for two weeks by September 8th. It is incredibly important that we rely on scientific data and not follow any political agendas when coming to safety, safely open, reopening our schools. As many families will not be comfortable yet to return to in-person instruction, we can do more to accommodate these. Can we do more to accommodate these families? Is there a way to continue virtual learning through live streaming the classes? Switching to the online academy where the curriculum is different will make it difficult for students to transition. The online school does not offer the immersion program, which will be a huge loss for many of our immersion students. What about a hybrid model approach? This seems like an ideal option to get our of our students back safely in school. And that's the end of time for that comment. And Dr. Burdick will continue. I mean, I should say, Mrs. Scotto will continue. The next comment is from Brandon. Brendan Anderson of Phoenix. Dear C CCUSD board, we are parents of a student attending Horseshoe Trails, a place where our son has felt cared for, supported and loved. We are so thankful for the dedication shown by Horseshoe Trails and by CCUSD as a whole. Children need to be back in school and we urge the CCUSD board to vote that the projected start date of September 8th continue as planned. In our, in our own son and among his peers and their families, the effects of long-term separation from an in-school learning environment are taking a significant toll. We are thankful to hear that teachers were given the option of transferring to the Cave Creek Academy of Ex Excellence if they had concerned about risk associated with in-person learning. As parents, we are simply requesting to be afforded the same kind of choice to allow us to make the choice to send our children to vital in-person learning. This is a matter of their physical, emotional, academic well-being. 
the CDC agrees. In their recent article posted at cdc.gov, the CDC cites scientific study after study pointing to the need for schools to reopen. They clearly state, quote, the harms attributed, and that is time for that comment. The next comment is from Dr. Angela Robertson of Cave Creek. Good evening. I applaud the board for their foresight in selecting a date to reopen that is now promising to coincide with meeting the benchmarks recommended by the state and county. Thank you for your earlier decision. In the board meeting on 720, it was noted that as board members, you did not expect to have to make public health decisions and that the government leaders and public health departments who should have been making these decisions were not providing helpful guidance. Now that those organizations are at least giving concrete, helpful guidance, let us follow it. The data from the county dashboard qualify the district for in-person learning. Now is the time to plan the transition to a, quote, hybrid learning scenario, end quote, so we can have children back in school on September 8th. Let us not delay planning until the next dashboard update on the 3rd, leaving teachers and staff only a day to prepare. Instead, let us anticipate that the next dashboard update will confirm our decision to move forward. One of the great benefits of the Maricopa County dashboarding guidance is its geographical precision with respect to the metrics. And that's time on that comment. The next comment is from Jill Wallaby of Cave Creek. First, I want to thank the teachers and staff at Cactus Shadows for making the start of this school year a success. Although I understand the students need for social interaction and I want my son to be in the classroom, I'm asking you to please follow the recommendation of the Maricopa Maricopa County Health Department for the safe reopening of schools that states all three benchmarks should be green for a two week period before in person learning resumes. Right now our district only has two benchmarks that are green. As you stated previously, it is impossible to social distance the students once they return to class. And because of this, I believe the in person start date should be postponed. The next comment is from Stacy Tracy of Cave Creek. Good evening, CCUSD 93 board. I am a concerned parent in the CCUSD 93 school district, and I know I am speaking on behalf of many other concerned parents about the well being of our children. The CCUSD children have been out of school since March and continue to keep them out of the traditional brick and mortar school is causing stress on the families and children. I don't know if any board have any elementary age children, but many are not thriving, spending numerous hours a day looking at a computer screen. It is not healthy for them. Schools need to reopen like the rest of the Arizona schools and businesses that have been open to support the communities they serve. I work for a large not-for-profit health system and overall things are looking really good. We really need to get some normalcy back for our children. <clears throat> Since CCUSD 93 currently meets two of the three recommended benchmark and one if very close, there should be no concern opening on September 8 as planned. We are already delayed one month in opening the schools. Another delay would be detrimental to the kids. We shouldn't, and that is time on that comment. The next comment is from Rachel Schwartz Olson of Cave Creek. My name is Rachel Schwartz Olson, and I have always been very proud to have my children attend the schools in the CCUSD and so grateful that CCUS 93 has always striven for excellence in our schools. I'm writing today to express my concern of your possible change in the plans to reopen our CCUSD schools. I'm hoping that CCUSD will do the right thing for our children. We must stay on course and resume, resume to in-person learning on September 8th as our kids are suffering academically, emotionally, and physically right now under the remote learning model. We all recognize that this is not an easy thing to do, but as an A-plus school district, there is absolutely no reason that we cannot find a way to accomplish this. As parents, we of all people are looking out for what is best for our children. Of course, in-person learning may not be right thing for all families, but this is why you have options. Please do the right thing for our families and kids that want to need and need to be in-person learning. It is important to keep in mind that the AZ benchmarks are a recommended guidance, and that is time on that comment. Next comment is from Lori DeSico of Cave Creek. Dear Dr. Burdick, President Hill, and members of the governing board, this is my 17th year living and working in CCUSD, and I am saddened by the divide our district is experiencing right now. There is not one teacher <clears throat> or staff member that would argue the fact that kids learn better in person and need to be at school. It's the risk of illness and potential death where everyone seems to disagree. We can't make decisions based on subjective emotions, pressure, or wishful thinking. 
Don't we expect the same of our children when we make choices? If we were to ignore the data, we would all throw caution to the wind and return tomorrow. There is no data supporting the September 8 return date. The only way to make a decision based on objective information is to use the Arizona and Maricopa County Health Department risk benchmarks. The Arizona and Maricopa County Public Health Department School Reopening Dashboard and Guidance recommends 14 consecutive days of green, low risk, in all three benchmarks before opening to traditional in-person learning. This will definitely not guarantee, and that is time on that comment. The next comment is from Kimberly Rowland in Cave Creek. Good evening. In response to the motion that in-person school be extended to October 12th, I would like to relay a few thoughts. My husband and I have twin first graders in the CCUSD that love school. And while we are making the best of online distance, we are struggling for two reasons. First of all, my son has autism. Being in school to receive all his services that are required by law is immensely important, not to even start to mention the social emotional growth that happens at this age in general, but for any child on the spectrum or with special needs, being cooped up and not having the opportunity to go to school is detrimental. Secondly, my daughter is in one of the immersion programs in our district, which is the entire reason we picked to move to Cave Creek so our children could participate in these highly regarded programs. Being online for half the day in another language after missing out on the opportunities lost from March until now has been immense. It is affecting her studies and mental health. Immersion students need to be in the classroom environment with their teachers and peers. That is time on that comment. The next comments from Brittany Horrocks of Cave Creek. Dear CCUSD School Board, it is with great respect that I implore you to keep the in-person start date of Tuesday, September 8, 2020. I have two middle school students enrolled in Sonoran Trails and over the past few weeks, I have seen their love of learning and excitement for school plummet due to anxiety, fear, uncertainty, and frustration due to, to the technical issues that plague the distance learning. Neither of my children thrive in an online environment and are suffering greatly. Depression is increasing and motivation is dropping. We are a very educationally focused family and with working parents, we make it a priority with parental involvement, yet my children are still struggling. My children need to go back to an in-person learning environment where they can be taught to and engage in face-to-face -face discussion with their teachers and their peers. There is so much more to learning that can be conveyed on a screen from body language to shifts in expression. The subtle quest of social appropriateness are being missed and our children will be at a disadvantage. If the in-person start date is pushed from next Tuesday and that's time on that comment. The next comment is from Mark and Erica Popenhagen of Cave Creek. Dear Dr. Burdick and CCUSD board, we would like to begin by saying how much we appreciate the chance to voice our concerns related to the safe return to school, as well as our appreciation to the teachers and school staff that have been making distant learning go so well. We would respectfully implore the board to continue distance learning beyond September 8th. While we understand that distance learning is not optimal and can be a hardship for some, we believe that this is the safest and most prudent thing to do at this time, especially since the state benchmarks metrics have not yet reached quote green 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 end quote but rather are quote yellow yellow green end quote children are not immune to COVID-19 and many will who survive are showing startling post-infection issues not seen in adults that have yet to be truly understood we strongly believe that the safety and well-being of all children served by CCUSD must be protected and that the board should base their decisions on science rather than the minority who though loud do not ethically and morally, the will. And that is time on that comment. The next comment is from Joe Kovac of Scottsdale. CCUSD is scheduled to begin in-person learning on September 8, nearly six months after the initial discontinuance. The CDC has issued guidelines for the reopening of in-person learning and highly recommend that school districts reopen in person, but do so in conjunction with any local health guidelines. <clears throat> the CDC stretches, stresses the importance of in-person learning for students because other than a child's home, no other setting has more influence on a child's health and well-being than the school, and that environment promotes instruction, social and emotional, developmental, nutritional needs, and physical activity. The CDC also indicates that available evidence indicates COVID-19 poses a relatively low risk to school-aged children. 
The CDC reports that as of July 17th, children represent 7% of positive COVID-19 cases and 0.1% of COVID-19 related deaths. And while any death to a child is catastrophic, this represents a lower percentage than annual flu related deaths of children. Additionally, CDC findings, and that's time on that comment. Dr. Burdick will continue. The next comment is from Shelley Niffen from Phoenix. As a CCUSD parent and staff member, I want to encourage you to use the metric requirements recommended by Governor Ducey. I want so badly to be back in class with my students and I desperately want my own children to be back in school with their peers and, te peers and teachers. However, my desire to resume traditional brick and mortar school cannot outweigh the need to do so responsibly, safely, and most importantly, permanently. Our kids have had three weeks to adjust to virtual school and establish a sense of normalcy and routine. While not ideal, it is at least consistent and expected. We would all be delighted to return to school, but not to return too soon and then have our schools close again due to an outbreak, which would be deflating and even more heartbreaking than not returning at all. I fear such an outcome is as much a threat to our kids' mental and emotional health as any illness to their physical well-being. Some may accuse me, a teacher, of simply wanting to avoid work. Let me assure you, teachers have never done more work than we are doing right now. This job now consumes more of my time and energy than traditional school ever has. And that is time on that comment. The next comment is from Michael Murphy of Carefree. Dear Dr. Burdick and Governing Board, I am writing in support of the administration's recommendation to use the MCDPH metrics to determine when it is safe to return to school as outlined in your discussion document on item number 4.2. As a pharmacist and as a citizen observing the experience that schools and universities around the nation are having as they try to return to in-person learning, I realize that one of the most important determinants of safety of returning to school is the amount of community spread. Therefore, I believe that the Maricopa County Department of Public Health's decision to use metrics that are more conservative than the Arizona Department of Health Safety's recommendations, as well as to use district boundaries for the measurement of those metrics are wise decisions. If the observance of these metrics delay the return to school, the later start date will have other benefits. As we learn more about the spread of COVID-19, we realize that a gathering of people in an enclosed space with limited ventilation, especially where people are talking, increases the risk of transmission. And that's time on that comment. The next comment is from Sydney Mellon from Cave Creek. As a mother to two elementary age children, I am in strong support of all kids returning to school September 8th. The online school has actually been going well for my girls. They like the lessons their teachers provide and they get their assignments turned in on time. It is very unfortunate though that this means a large part of their time is devoted to a screen. They each spend about three hours just on Zoom calls and another two hours on homework and learning games. From the time I became a mother, a strong emphasis has been placed on limited screen time and encouraging other forms of learning and entertainment. Continuing distance learning as the only method of schooling ignores decades of data related to childhood development and importance of face-to-face -face interaction. Although my daughters are succeeding in this learning format, not all of their needs are being met. They have a need to meet their teachers and develop a relationship with them outside of the computer screen. They have a need to make new friends and strengthen the friendships they already have. They have a need to interact, experience conflict, and learn how to solve problems without us parents telling them what the answer is. And that's time on that comment. The next comment is from Hattie Swart from Phoenix. Some things the community needs to know. There are roughly 2,000 students and staff at Cactus Shadows, each of whom attend up to six classes a day with anywhere from 30 to 40 students in each. These classes take place in rooms that if desks were spread out even three feet apart as opposed to suggested six would hold 16 students. There are no windows that can open and due to safety concerns, doors have to remain shut and locked so there's zero ventilation. There is no current plan for social distancing either in the classroom or on campus as students arrive and leave, switch classes or eat lunch. Bathroom use will be extremely limited, even locked during passing periods to prevent congregation in a small, highly contagious environment. This means students will always have to use class time to use the restroom. Teachers are only being given one bottle of disinfectant, four microfiber towels, which will be laundered once a week, and a thing of hand sanitizer to mitigate spread. 
classes throughout the day will be asked to wipe with these reusable rags down desk chairs, technology and school materials, both before and after class begins and ends. And that's time on that comment. The next comment is Sosheta Shaw from Scottsdale. I understand the need for students to return to in-person classes. This is especially important for special needs students, but we have to understand the ramifications of sending the kids back to school when the health department has set benchmarks for the pandemic. Some are stating that other schools are opening safely, but have they looked at the precautions they're taking? Do they have the same positivity rates as we do? We cannot, Cave Creek schools cannot open just because other schools are. Every area has a different level of cases. Our district does not have the same opening plans as other schools. Schools in New Jer Jersey have split the kids into two groups. Each group attends schools different days and only attend in the morning and go home before lunch. They also have plexiglass barriers around each student. Queen Creek's High School also has barriers around each desk. We cannot start just because other schools are starting. We need to look at the cases in areas our students and staff live. I'm in full support of the green, 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 waiting until all zip codes meet benchmarks. This is for the safety of our children. That is time on that comment. The next comment is from Marianne Morarity. I urge the board to consider what other, I'm sorry, from Scottsdale. I urge the board to consider what other school districts in the area are doing in regard to reopening in-person education for children. Colleges have not yet begun successful reopening without the spread of COVID-19. So why would you think elementary students running around a playground or eating in congregate and they cannot wear masks while eating would be different? Why are social, we are social people and children very often do not think before they act. I very much want my granddaughter to return to Black Mountain Elementary School, but not until it is safe. First CCUSD said it would could not adhere to CDC social distancing and many other safety requirements stipulated. So now it should keep our children safe and not be the canaries in the cave. They're our priceless future, not our essential workers. Keep our children and our teachers safe at home. The next comment is from Treasure Milanovic from Cave Creek. As I have stated before, first and foremost, I want to acknowledge appreciation to all teachers, administrators, and board members during this unprecedented time. As this is my second letter stating my opinion on the subject, I will skip any and all science data and supposed facts as I know this has already been covered by many. I will focus solely on what's happening within our home and board members can choose to act or ignore the facts in regard to the social emotional wellness of our children, which is being played out in front of our eyes. When I walk into my kids' rooms in the middle of the day, the first thing I notice when they look into my eyes is the distance I see in theirs. I see a dimming happening in their eyes of my children from this distance being forced upon them. As a meditation teacher, yoga teacher, and life coach, I will speak to you in the terms that I teach in, that I live in, that I share with my children. We are human beings that require contact and connection. By denying our children the choice to physically connect with their friends, peers, and teachers, you're denying them the most basic function required as human beings. It breaks my heart, and I'm sorry, that's the end of time. The next comment is by Samantha Craigle, and uh, she is in Phoenix. Dear members of the board, Thank you to the administration, teachers, and staff for all your hard work during this difficult time. I have two boys at Horseshoe Trails Elementary School, sixth grade and second grade. My hope is that the schools will resume face-to-face -face learning September 8th. Everyone in my immediate and extended family is safely, successfully working on the front lines. My sister's a nurse working in a hospital COVID unit for the past three months, and she has not contracted the virus, nor have any of her coworkers thus far. My mother-in-law works at Fry's Grocery Store, interacting with hundreds of people on a daily basis. She too has not contracted the virus and is considered in a more vulnerable population. My aunt works full-time at Primrose Daycare, which has remained open throughout the pandemic. She has not contracted the virus. She's older with underlying health conditions and her preschoolers do not wear masks. My point in sharing these examples is twofold. One, these people are local to our area. Two, with proper precautions, they're able to work safely. These are just a few examples. My brother is in the army and at basic training. My mom is a nanny. My dad's a realtor and that is time on that comment. The next comment is from Guy Melton in Cave Creek. It is a time to open up the schools for classroom learning as soon as possible. Online schooling is incapable of addressing the multitude of behavioral learning differences with children and lacks attention to these children and their learning abilities. In addition, 
peer learning is essential to social learning skills. As an example, the students in language immersion studies are crippled in their academic success, using online schooling as a basis for their skill set without in-person conversation and lesson plans. Thank you for your consideration. Next comment is from Shauna Carlson of Cave Creek. I wish for the board to fully consider implications for starting in-person schools September 8th, 2020. Per the most recent metrics on the Maricopa County School Reopening Dashboard and guidance, the cities of Cave Creek and Carefree do not yet meet all three metrics identified by the Arizona Department of Health Services for safely reopening for in-person instruction. The source is um, maricopa.gov uh, slash 5594 slash school metrics. Carefree, overall risk level substantial and recommended learning scenario is virtual with online support. Cases per 100,000 equals 36.08 yellow. Percent positivity, 15% red. COVID-like illness, 3% green. Cave Creek overall risk level is moderate with recommended learning scenario virtual with on-site support until less than 7% positive for two weeks. Cases per 100,000 equals 24.4 yellow. Percent positivity, 2.44% green. COVID-like illness, 3% green. And that is the time for that comment. And Dr. Pratt will continue reading comments. <clears throat> the next comment is from Vanessa Yanolovich from Cave Creek. I understand that the lack of staff resources are the sole concern when considering mandatory temperature checks on students and staff entering school grounds. The current mitigation plan is to have parents conduct the checks at home prior to arriving at school and to keep students home if ne as necessary. Please advise if there are Will be, will be any discussions to adjust this plan and implement mandatory temperature checks upon entering school grounds. My concern as a parent is not that making this mandatory process upon arrival will allow students and staff to come in onto campus ill and potentially spread the virus. It may be possible for the individual school PTOs to, staff to organize a sign up for parents to volunteer their, their time to assist with this process, as well as collect donations for non-contact thermometers. This will lessen the resource limitations as well as financial costs associated. Implementing this mandatory check with specific guidelines is a crucial step to ensuring our students and, and safe staff are kept safe when welcoming them back to in-person schooling. That was the end of time for that comment. The next comment is from Buffy Peglowski from uh, Cave Creek. I am kindly asking the board and school district to listen to the parents that chose the in-person learning option back in July. We have not been given our choice, which was in-person learning for our children. Those that chose to remain home and do online schooling have been given their choice when the district created the AOE. Our students have suffered enough since they, since they started back in March. They haven't been given the opportunity to go to school for five months now. I will say that the end of the last school year versus now is drastically different with online school, but it is still not the same as in-person learning. I hear arguments from the other side. It's like, you just want a babysitter for your kids. That is, couldn't be farther from the truth for these families. Me personally, my children are in 11th and 8th grade. They can babysit themselves. They want to go to school to learn and be social with their friends and teachers. Both of my kids have always loved going to school and have been well-rounded students. Both have participated in school sports and extracurricular activities. That's the end of time for that comment. The next comment is from Madison Peglowski from Cave Creek. As a student at Cactus Shadows, I would like to say that I would like to go back to school. As a student taking four AP classes online just does not do learning justice. I feel as if we are being robbed of our education. Online learning is setting us back for many years to come. Please take into consideration what kind of effect this is having on students when preparing for SATs and thinking about what colleges that we are going to apply for. Please listen to our voices as we want to be heard. Maddie Pikowski. That's the end of that comment. The next comment is from Wayne Melton from Cave Creek. I am a first responder and on the front lines of this pandemic. I firmly believe that all numbers for this have been exaggerated. While I admit that this is a real sickness, I also know firsthand how inflated the numbers are. What I see as a bigger issue than COVID-19 is the way it is affecting children. I have watched as my two boys, grades second and fourth, have declined in their learning. Let me be clear that I do not blame any of this on the teachers as I know they are doing their best with given circumstance. I blame the district for not seeing through the inflated numbers and allowing our, students to, our children to resume in-person learning. 
my boys are part of the immersion program as I am sure a lot of students are. And it is imperative that they have this immersion learning in a classroom with their teachers and peers. They should not be sitting in front of a computer watching a video to decipher the language on their own. Being a first responder, I am aware of the dangers of returning to in-person schooling, but feel there is much bigger, much higher danger if children continue even through October 12th at home online schooling. Not to mention what this, that is the end of time for that comment. The next comment is from Leticia, Leticia Chait um, from Phoenix. My sentiment that student in-person learning should not return until the metrics laid out by Maricopa County have been met. As, as of today, these metrics have not been met. The green light for in-person learning according to the Department of Public Health and Medical Experts is one, two weeks of testing positivity below 5% and two, two weeks of cases fewer than 10 per 100,000 population. I feel that a target date of October at the turn of the quarter is a more viable date. One, it gives the district the time to implement sustainable safety product protocols. Two, it gives Cave Creek the time it needs in order to meet the metrics that have been laid out by the Arizona Department of Health Medical Experts. Thank you for your consideration. That is the end of that comment. The next comment is from Andrew Daly, Phoenix. My name is Andrew Daly and I'm an English teacher at Cactus Shadows High School. I'm writing to you to ask that you consider pushing the start date for in-person learning back further than September 8th. Instead of choosing an arbitrary date, I ask that we follow Governor Deuce's recommendation of waiting till all three metrics are met for 14 consecutive days before we return. This is the only true safe way to return to in-person learning. My classroom is roughly 30 by 20, not all of which is usable space. And let me point out that I have one of the largest classrooms in my entire department. Most of them are substantially smaller than mine. This space doesn't account for my desk area, the space at the front of the room that needs to be left open for students to see the board and the storage bookshelves that can't be moved because they're attached to the walls. If I were to give each student desk a six foot bubble, I would only be able to fit roughly 16 desks in my room. My largest class is 34 students and my smallest is 29, which is still 13 desks more than there should be in the room. The social distancing that will be done with desks is only about a foot and a half and that's the end of time for that comment. The next comment is from Michael DePinto from Scottsdale. If the school district is going to move forward with September 8th in-person schooling, is the district fully prepared with in-person plan? For example, are the buildings, classrooms, library, lunchroom, gym, school grounds, et cetera, set up and ready to go? Our family is 100% for starting school on September 8th. It would be disappointing if the decision is made to go back to school and the district needs more time to prepare the facilities, et cetera. If the district does, decides not to move forward on September 8th in-person learning, can the teachers teach virtually from their classrooms versus their homes? I understand Dicer School District and other schools in Arizona around this, uh, and around the US are using this method. That is the end of that comment. Next comment is from Emmy Rood, a um, student from Scottsdale. Dear school governing board, I'm a junior at Cactus Shadows. I know you say you are thinking about the well being of students and teachers, but it would be better if we could go back to school on September 8th. I really don't want to spend most of my year doing online school. Please let us go back. I wish the goal was to get us back in school in person because it didn't, doesn't feel like that right now. I don't like online school. I don't like not being able to easily ask teachers for questions questions or for better explanations. I don't like sitting in my room all day with small breaks. I feel isolated and alone. I would like to interact with my teachers, classmates, and friends. I was one of those kids that was angry when school was canceled last spring, so imagine how I feel now. I never treated the online learning like summer started early. I worked harder and took it seriously. By postponing, you are just making me hate school, and I'm not sure I'm the one, I'm not the only one. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. Please consider how the students feel. Thank you, CSHS Junior. That is the end of that comment. <clears throat> the next comment is from Cynthia Kane from Cave Creek. Dear Superintendent Burdick, President Hill, and members of the governing board, I am writing to ask that we consider the September 8th return of in-person school instruction at CCUSD. While it is clear that kids learn better in person and benefit from the interaction with teachers and peers, the science says it is not safe to do so at this time. The return of in-person learning needs to follow the guidelines wet, met by our state and county health departments. It is my understanding that CCUSD does not meet the rec recommended 14-day green status in the three benchmarks that 
that have been set for reopening. The safety and well-being of the district's teachers and staff must be considered. It is unfair to ask teachers to put themselves at risk of contracting COVID-19 and to risk the safety of their family members, of family members, some of whom have underlying health conditions. You cannot expect teachers to perform their jobs to the best of their ability if they do not feel safe at work. A human being's most basic need of safety, according to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, is crucial for humans to function optimally. No matter how much we want to go, want to return to in-person learning, and that is the end of that comment for time. The next comment is from Stacy Leshner from Cave Creek. I am writing to you out of concern for the September 8th reopening date. While I very much want my children to back in normal school, I implore you to only reopen the district when it is safe to do so based off the benchmarks provided by the health department. Currently, we, st we have still not met the benchmark to reopen schools. It, has been widely, is, it is being widely reported that we might possibly meet the benchmark on Thursday when updated data is presented. But at this current time, when you are meeting to decide whether or not to reopen schools, we have not met these benchmarks. The two nearest districts, Scottsdale and Paradise Valley, have clear plans in place for reopening their schools. Scottsdale School District is not returning to at full capacity, but instead doing a hybrid model. Cave Creek apparently does not have this option available. PV District has announced that they will only go back when the benchmark shows that they are in the green area. And even once they have met the benchmark, they are giving a two week grace period to help teachers and parents readjust to going back to school in person. I urge you to follow either one of those districts plans for reopening. Uh, and that's end, ending that comment for time. Uh, okay, the next comment is from um, Karen Peglowski from Cave Creek. As an eighth grade student at Sonoran Trails Middle School, I am asking that you please let us go back to school on September 8th. And that is the end of that comment. And Mrs. Scotto will continue. The next comment is from Dennis Peglowski of Cave Creek. I ask that you keep this in mind when deciding to reopen the schools. Ignore the emails and requests to keep the schools closed. Parents and students that want the schools to remain closed have an option to go to online school. So what difference does it make if the schools are open for them? No one is forcing them to go to in-person learning. However, we are being forced to do online if you refuse to open the schools. All indications that the Maricopa County will meet the three benchmarks to reopen on Thursday. So please do not change the date from 9-7-20 as our return to school date. I ask you to please prepare as if school is going to open next Tuesday. And if the numbers on Thursday don't meet the three benchmarks, then push the start date back. That's the end of that comment. The next comment is from Jenny Utterback of Cave Creek. To the members of the CCUSD School Board and Superintendent, I'm writing again on behalf of my four elementary school children on the night of this important vote to open our schools on September 8th. There are many of us in the district who want the choice of in-person learning for our children. Our community needs to demonstrate its ability to function through the fears and realities of COVID-19. While scientific metrics and data are an important piece of this decision, our children are depending on us to make decisions that will not only keep them safe, but will also enable their growth. My five-year-old son is in kindergarten, has an IEP, and struggles to engage online with his speech teacher. The whole kindergarten experience at home has been really challenging for him, even with his exceptional teachers doing all they can to support him from a distance. My six-year-old daughter is in first grade, is a bright student, and recently expressed herself last week by pulling out all of her eyelashes. Strong schools need strong families, and strong families need strong schools. We need your support and leadership right now. Please make a decision. And that is uh, time on that comment. Next comments from Katie Angeli of Cave Creek. Dear Governing Board and Dr. Burdick, in advocating for a back to school date, I would encourage the board to consider using the predetermined state metrics as a guide for our return to face-to-face -face learning. I would also encourage that all of the zip codes that our district services be included for consideration when determining the safety of a return. Thank you for the good work you do. Those are the end of her comments. Next comments are from Robin Enriquez of Scottsdale. Hello, I would like to take this time to urge the board to keep the in-person return date for CCUSD for September 8 as scheduled. I know I'm not alone in saying that children need in-person instruction. I will speak of my family's experience thus far with quote, virtual online learning, end quote. 
the teachers and staff at DSA are doing their best to help students succeed with this new learning program, but the program is failing. There is no replacement for the benefits of in-person instruction. The benefits of in-person reach beyond academics. They are social, emotional, physical, and psychological. My seven and nine-year-old are not computer geniuses, nor do I expect them to be at this age. Children were not meant to sit at a computer screen for hours on end and then be expected to type up their assignments. This is asking too much of the kids and parents. When I come home from work at night, I want to spend my time soaking up my kids, not trying to get them to spend more time on the computer to get their work done. That often ends in tears and frustration from everyone. I'm literally watching my kids' love for learning diminish a little each day. And that is time for those comments. The next comments are from Kyle Quo of Phoenix. To the board, Debbie Burdick, and to the rest of the staff at CCUSD about to be mandated to be put in an unsafe workplace environment above and beyond what is already quest of you on a regular basis, I implore the board to reconsider and delay the start of in-school instruction. While the state may say it is safe to reopen schools, I do want to remind you that not long ago, the same state leadership had to reclose many places of businesses due to a spike in positive cases in Arizona and trying to quote, reopen, end quote, reintroducing a younger population who researchers have said a majority are asymptomatic to tight quarter quarters classrooms, not only put staff at direct risk, but their families at home as well. The education of future generations is incredibly important. I can be the first to tell you of the many lessons I learned at my, at my time as student at multiple CCUSD schools. While the delay of in-person classes can be viewed as troubling to some, it's my belief that it's a priority for the society we live in to sacrifice in-person classes for Zoom. That's time on those comments. The next comments are from Den Daniel and Michelle Ramos of Cave Creek. Good afternoon, members of the board. First of all, we want to thank you for your hard work and dedication during this time. While we cannot wait for our fourth grader to go back to school, we want this to be in a safe environment as safely as possible. We have been following the data and we are glad to see that two out of the three health benchmarks have been met. It seems as if we are pretty close, however, not quite there yet since we still have one more benchmark to be met. Therefore, we're asking two things. One, to delay school reopenings until we have more data as to how the spread of the virus affects not only students and teachers, but also the rest of the community. Up until now, our kids have been home for the most part, slowing down the virus spread, and perhaps that has allowed some of the state benchmarks to be met. In the meantime, we can continue to observe other school districts locally and throughout the country that have reopened in order to obtain a better idea of how reopening schools affects our benefits, our students and the rest of the community. I understand there are parents that do want to send their kids to school and they should have that option. For the parents that don't want to send their children due to safety concerns, the below two items, and that's time on those comments. The next comment is from Jordan Klaus of Cave Creek. Good evening, board members. I'm a senior at Cactus Shadows and I'm writing to ask you to please vote yes to return us to in-person learning on 9-8. I do not feel like I'm learning at the level I should be for my senior year. My eyes are hurting because I find myself straining to stay focused on the computer screen. I miss the teachers, staff, and campus connection with other students. Please help me have a successful final year at Cactus Shadows. Thank you for your time, Jordan, Cave Creek. The next comments are from Deanna Dusak of Cave Creek. I am writing with a plea to please consider returning to in-person school as planned on September 8th. I have two children currently enrolled at Horseshoe Trails, one in fourth grade Mandarin immersion and one in kindergarten Mandarin immersion. Over the past four weeks, we have done our best to adapt to distance learning, but it's evident that this is not a long-term solution to best educate our children. My husband and I both work full time. We are lucky that he is able to work from home, but I work outside the home in a job that cannot be done from home. When my husband is working, it is near impossible to manage two children online learning particularly one who is five year old and not able to independently follow links, manage her schedule and understand the assignments that are being completed. Further, the immersion program needs to be in person for the children, especially those just entering the program to grasp and retain the content. My daughter watches the videos and repeats the words, but is not retaining anything. Watching video, videos and having one Zoom call per day is not true immersion. My kindergartner who is extremely smart, bright, social, that's time on those comments. 
The next comments are from Helene Sokol of Phoenix. Good evening, Dr. Burdick and governing board members of CCUSD 93. I'm writing to you tonight to ask you to consider using the AZDHS board metrics for a safe return for schooling. I understand this is a difficult position for you all to be in. Unfortunately, this is a no-win situation that we're faced with. The Maricopa County Department of Health created these metrics as a guide for the districts to determine what would be the optimal time to return safely back to school. The numbers are promising, but I would like to see a continuous downward trend before opening the schools to full capacity. I understand the district doesn't have the funding available to fully equip the staff and teachers with what they need to create a safe environment, which large size classes and the determination by the CDC <coughs> that the 10 to 19 year old age group can spread this virus as easily as adults. It is only a matter of time before our small community will be effective. We should be looking at other states and districts as another tool to gauge our ability to open safely, according to the South Florida, and that is time on her comment. The next comment is from Winnie Sarabia of Cave Creek. In regards to reopening metrics and how CCUSD will respond, please strongly consider Burdick's recommendation of not opening until all three metrics are in the green and the trend is sustained for a period of two weeks prior to returning. Just a reminder, 14% of CCUSD student population are in 42 different zip codes and close to half of district employees live in 68 different zip codes. I understand that you are trying to meet the needs and many un under all varying circumstances. As an institution, please consider the health and welfare of your staff and teachers, the most vulnerable and the shortage of teachers in the state of Arizona. The impact of the decision to reopen too soon is long lasting, not only for teachers, but even for young children. While we don't know the long-term impact, we know they can contract the virus at different level and can pass to the vulnerable groups, whether it's in their home, childcare, teachers, staff, or the likes. I want my child back in school, but not at the risk of my family member's health or those that I love. If we return to school, we would need to isolate. And that is the time on her comments and Dr. Burdick will continue with more. This comment is from Jennifer Louis Dear CC, from Cave Creek. Dear CCUSD Governing Board, it is time to honor your last vote and open our schools for instruction on Tuesday, September 8th. Metrics have consistently shown that risk in Cave Creek Carefree Real Verde is extremely low and does not merit the closure of schools. Other schools, charter, private, and public are already opening or have plans to open very soon with metrics that are much less desirable than CCUSDs. In fact, a mix of greens and yellows are appropriate. The metrics have shown for a while now that we should be in hybrid at a minimum. Additionally, why can't teachers get ready this week for in-person learning instead of waiting until the go-ahead and delaying another week of instruction? We know that we will be back eventually. Why not prepare right now? You could sacrifice one day of online learning to let teachers get ready rather than sacrifice a week of in-person. Parents have consistently shared their desire to return to brick and mortar learning via surveys and letters to the board, as well as numerous social media posts. As elected officials, I beg you to listen to the community and open the schools. We cannot continue to watch the future of the students in our community diminish. This is the end due to time. The next comment is from Evie Peebler of Cave Creek. I am an eighth grader at Sonoran Trails Middle School. I have struggled deeply with online school. I feel deeply disconnected from my teachers and classroom. I am usually the A plus student and now I have C's and D's. Over the summer and online school, I've felt lonely and unsociable. If we go back to school, many other students and I can go back to our sociable lives. I would be willing to go back to school under any circumstances. Stay six feet away, wear a mask, et cetera. Thank you for your time. The next comment is from Tanaz Brock and she is in Cave Creek. Please, we really need to have our children go back to school face to face. It is so important that they be there not only for a better education, but for socialization as well. They are stuck home behind a screen all day by themselves. This is not doing any good for them. They need to be with their peers and their teachers. Some children have a rough time at home and school is their saving grace. Others do not learn as well from school and need extra help. And sports, they need to have their sports. They need to burn off extra energy. Every year our schools deal with the flu and strep throat, which I feel is way worse and we have never shut down. I beg you to please let our children go back next week. If we delay the start of in-person schooling any longer, there could be long-term damage to our children. 
they will lose socialization skills. Some are depressed and others might cope in the wrong ways. Thank you. The next is from Dennis Day from Phoenix. Board members and Dr. Burdick, I write to you today to express my expectations for a safe return to in-person schooling. I understand that within the district, there are diverse, diverse and strongly held opinions as to how and when students, teachers, and staff should return to campus. In the absence of clear leadership from state government on the topic of reopening, you're challenged with the daunting task of weighing the education needs of students alongside the health risks facing students, teachers, and staff to arrive at a decision that will bring students back on safe campus safely. I share your priority to have students return to school and believe that in order for you to arrive at the best decision on the matter, it's important for the voices of teachers to be heard since we have a key stake in the outcome. Physical factors, consider the physical arrangement of the high school. The challenges posed by reopening at Cactus Shadows differ from those from elementary and middle. The full complement of 2000 students and over 100 teachers and staff on the existing campus is unique in the district. And that is time on that comment. The next comment is from Vincent Carlson of Scottsdale. In the past few days, businesses throughout the state have been allowed to reopen. While this is a good thing, it's fragile. The opening statewide was done despite many of the recommendations from the CDC. This creates the possibility for additional infections as it did when we reopened this summer. The surge was also compounded by the holiday where more people gathered in large social gatherings. Our proposed opening date, one week after reopening businesses and a day after Labor Day is a recipe for another surge. Children are the most likely to be asymptomatic. And even with the efforts of adults, the youngest have difficulty following mask rules, runs, ones they may not have practice with. In the stores in our town, I've seen children and parents from the school, my children attend without masks at a time that they should practice, but also a time that they could be infected. I encourage you to look at the results from school openings elsewhere in the nation on the NEA school and campus COVID-19 reporting site. There are 12 reports for Arizona and hundreds nationwide. Link provided below. And that is time on that comment. The next comment is from Larry and Angeli Treffs, and they are in Cave Creek. Our family strongly requests that the schools be opened for in-person learning on or before September 8th, 2020. Parents of Tristan Trifoy, students at Cactus Shadows. The next comment is from Christina Steenson Beck from Scottsdale. Dear Dr. Burdick and Governing Board, thank you for taking the time to read and consider public comments on this matter. In my opinion, the most fair and appropriate approach would be to follow the MCDPH metrics for returning to school. When the Department of Public Health determines it is safe to return to in-person school, then we can set the date. This is much more sensible than returning on a date without significance. Let's be smart and stay safe. The next comment is from Jennifer Jacobs of Cave Creek. I am writing to submit my comments for the school start date of September 8th. I have two children in the district, an eighth grader at Snorin Trails, sixth grader at Horseshoe Trails. The online schooling is not working for our family. They receive very little actual online instruction and the rest of the time they watch pre-recorded videos. Half the time the internet and or Zoom is not cooperating. They're frustrated and discouraged. This is no way to learn and they are already suffering. They need to socially interact with others and their teachers. We have met the benchmarks to return to in-person and thus should be allowed to do so. Please let us return to in-person on September 8th. The next comment is from Carol Leonhart of Cave Creek. Comment to be read for the rector, record. Parents have been given the choice to keep their students home and learning online, but teachers have not been given the same choice. Teachers want to be in the classroom with their kids, but for many that means putting their own health or that of their families at risk. They're having to decide between their job and the health insurance it provides or their lives. Is that a fair choice for staff to make? These are people who work endless hours for not much pay in a position that is by so many underappreciated. Teachers are being bashed and blamed all over the country as if they caused the virus and are a lazy bunch who just don't want to work. But we know this is not true. I ask all the parents out there, why is your child sitting in a classroom that will look so far from normal instead of in front of a computer, the technology of our world and future for a couple months more important than their health or life, as well as that of their teachers. Schools are opening around the country and the virus is spreading quickly in crowded places where children and young adults are put together. 
That is the end of time. The next comment is from Jessica Fitzwater of Cape Creek. I write to you for the fourth time in what seems deaf ears. I am beyond disappointed with the district and the decisions being made for my son. When we moved here, one of the highlights was the amazing school district and many parents raved about it. I'm disappointed as I don't see you putting children first in the decisions you're making. You have not listened to the community or given us a fair option for in-person learning. You've chosen fear over facts. You have failed my child and many others like him. The science and data does not support another postponement of the opening date. October 12th is unacceptable and I'm not alone in my feelings. I was joined by at least 50 other parents and students at a rally. We help at the district to keep our opening date of 9-8. I wrote to Mrs. Burdick and you assured me that the opening date was 9-8, dismissed my fears that you would be pushing the opening date as that hasn't been discussed. I find very unlikely considering only two weeks later you called an emergency meeting. How is it possible things only change for the better in those two weeks? And that is time on that comment. Dr. Pratt will make the next comments. The next comment is from Chris Scott from Scottsdale. Dear Governing Board of the Cape Creek Unified School District, I'm a father of a student in the special education department in the district. I am kindly asking the board to vote to safely open schools with face-to-face -face learning on September 8th, 2020. It's heartbreaking to watch my child struggle. That goes for any parent. For those of us with children with special needs, watching their struggle with dis distance learning is a daily battle. It is not sustainable long-term with Without significant harm to this student population, this student population. I worry about what will happen if my child doesn't go back face-to-face -face learning. Practicing social skills, a major component of special needs education, is tough to do in isolation. I, the much dreaded R word is recession, but also regression. My son is not only failing, falling behind academically, but he is missing developmental milestones and losing key skills necessary for an independent life. Not going back as planned on September 8, 2020 would be disastrous for our children and it would take a toll on already stressed families. Thank you for your time. That is the end of that comment. The next comment is from Frank Leonhardt from Cave Creek. I urge you not to open schools prematurely. Please do not put our students and teachers at risk. According to the Academic of American Pediatrics, the rate of children infected with COVID-19 has increased from 5% to 9% between May and August. That rate increase has occurred with only partial reopening of the community and with schools still closed. Should schools open while community spread is still present, that rate is bound to increase dramatically. Online learning is not ideal, but it is working. Children are learning and they are not getting sick. We are fortunate enough to have the infrastructure in our community to provide to provide it. Is it ideal? No, but this is not a forever situation. It's a temporary pause of normalcy while we get the virus contained, something that will take everyone to do their part. 2020 is a year of the unimaginable. Sacrifices are having to be made, but those sacrifices would not be the, should not be the lives of our children or their teachers. That is the end of that comment. Next comment is from Don Hotling, Hotling from uh, Scottsdale. I support, I strongly support CCUSD schools keeping the opening date for in-person learning on September 8th, 2020. Mo most recent data currently has two of the metrics in the green for CCUSD with the metric that is being yellow, is yellow being 34.47 cases per 100,000 people. Per the Maricopa County Department of Public Health, they recommend the following benchmark thresholds to be met in order to offer the in-person learning. Two consecutive weeks with new cases below 100 per, per 100,000 people, two consecutive weeks with less than 7% positivity, and two consecutive weeks of COVID-like illness below 10%. These benchmark thresholds have been met for CCUSD. CCUSD is already offering hybrid learning and with giving the option for those who wish to have their students in online school to be online. Schools should be reopened on September 8th, 2020 for the students whose families have chosen in-person learning. I have two students and that is the end of time for that comment. The next comment is from Elizabeth Gonzalez from Scottsdale. I'm in favor of opening schools back up next month. Online school and Zoom calls are showing to be an ineffective way for children to learn. Lots of parents are working from home, leaving a child on their own 
to navigate through Canvas for assignments and Zoom calls. Having children learn to write their letters on a computer with a mouse is not ideal. What happened to only having 30 minutes of screen time a day because anything longer is bad for kids' eyes and causes overstimulation, especially for the younger kids? There has been a significant drop in COVID cases. A survey has already taken, was already taken showing that 57% of parents slash caretakers want to send their kids back to school in person full time. What happened to the majority rules? Parents have the option to keep their children home if they are not comfortable or if the child has a compromised immune system. Waiting for the perf perfect metric scientific data to present itself is an, in an imperfect, constantly changing world will never be satisfactory to people who are in defiance of opening schools. That is the end of that uh, comment because of time. The next comment is from Tiffany Johnston from Cave Creek. I am writing today to strongly voice my support of returning to in-person school on September 8th. We have reached two of three benchmarks and the third is highly subjective and could have questionable numbers. We are also very close, too close to wait until October. School is essential, school is needed. Everything else has opened. Numbers are dropping, sports are happening, clubs should happen. College numbers are minimal with kids living in close quarters. Please, give, please kids need school, they want school. Online education is not as effective as in person. That is the end of that comment. Next comment is Kristen Dreyer from Cave Creek. To the board, teachers and staff of CCUSD. I want to start by thanking you for all the work you have done during these unprecedented times. I currently have two children who attend elementary school in the Cave Creek District. After reading your agenda items, I have grown concerned with the direction that is being taken. I am strongly asking the board to vote open to vote opening schools safely on September 8th, 2020. If they push the date back, then I am strongly recommending they go based on recommendations of two weeks, on the recommendations of two weeks. I have been a medical provider for over 10 years and have been actively managing patients in the intensive care unit during this pandemic. I have seen COVID up close and I have seen the serious nature of this disease. With that said, I urge you to vote yes to open schools. There, through this time, we have seen how COVID affects children and the rate of transmission from child to child and child to adults is very low. What burdens my heart most is the health, is a health as a healthcare provider is the data we can't quantify at this time. And that's the end of time for that comment. The next comment is from James Sauer from Tempe. Please continue to support the AZDE DHS metrics for safe reopening to schools. The guidelines contained within within help ensure that all students and staff are safe as we continue to deal with the pandemic. We need to continue to slow the virus so we can get back to education safely and quicker than we otherwise would if potential setbacks occur in our failure to follow precautions. We must entrust that AZDHS has the strongest authority to make decisions as it relates to health risks in our community. Please consider the phase reopening plans of neighboring districts as well as there are certainly many students as well as staff that do not live within the district. Thank you. The next comment is from Jennifer Bullwitt from Cave Creek. My husband and I are in favor of our children returning back to school full-time or at minimum part-time. I want my children to be able to participate in sports as well. I am not concerned with social distancing. I would prefer my elementary school age child did not have to wear a mask. They're, they have been home for six months now. Our numbers in Arizona are fine. It's time to go back to school. I hope that my children's teachers have whatever PPE they feel necessary for their job. As a nurse, I use a mask and wash hands, hand sanitizer and wipe and wipes to clean surfaces. That's the end of that comment. The next comment is from Robert Young from Cave Creek. My wife and I, along with many other Cave Creek USD parents are very concerned about the the ability for our child to return to the classroom for face-to-face -face instruction this coming Tuesday the 8th. We understand that each parent has a right to address their individual concerns for their children and family safety. However, we believe the child's education is just as, if not more important. The current situation has been a strain on many families, including ours, in keeping up with our daily duties as business owners, employees, parents, and now part-time teachers. 
Unfortunately, the online option is not working for us at all. And we feel our daughter's education is suffering greatly without the ability to work directly with a teacher in person. We certainly understand the difficult decision you must make as advocates for our district. We, as advocates for our district, we believe you have the children's best interest at heart. We agree you must weigh the effect this may have to your employee's health as well. After reading and talking with the medical experts on this subject, we do not believe waiting another month or six months is going to have much, if any, impact. Um, and that's the end of that comment for time. Uh, the next comment is from Dr. and Mrs. Trollup from Scottsdale. We believe the decision to abide by the AZDHS guidelines is the appropriate and best course of action for our most important assets, our children and our teachers. We have an obligation to protect both parties. We ask that the board use their own standards. One, value parents as the child's first and best teacher. Two, every student will have the opportunity to learn in a safe environment. Three, develop and adhere to policies that create a healthy learning environment. The decision to not allow in-person classes is the best course of action until our health standards are officially met. By opening our schools too early is a lack of respect for teachers across our school community and demonstrates that safety is not the number one priority for our children and the staff. The AZDHS dashboard can be interpreted differently if the data is extrapolated inaccurately, which we see other schools and even parents doing. The CCSD board members agreed to meeting the state benchmarks in the July 20th meeting, acknowledging, and that's the end of that comment for time. And uh, Mrs. Scotto will continue. The next comment is from Andrew Kupo of Scottsdale. Dear governing board members, I write today to encourage and support your consideration of the AZDHS metrics for a safe reopening. I respectfully ask that the district adopt these metrics and their associated guidelines and then implement a quote, phased reopening end quote of CCUSD schools. I have been a member of the CCUSD family for over 26 years from preschooler to graduate to graduate to proud faculty member. As a student in CCUSD, I trusted my teachers and school administrators with my safety and education. Now as a member of the CCUSD staff, I do not take this responsibility lightly. Fortunately, there is good news. We don't have to make the decision alone. The guidelines set forth by the state and the clear data compiled by Maricopa County provide a straightforward and pragmatic approach to a safe return to school. We must follow them. While these guidelines require additional precautions that the district has already indicated won't be feasible, they are a solid roadmap. We cannot afford to disregard them. Furthermore, CCOSD schools are attended and staffed by many who live outside our district boundaries. And that is time on that comment. The next comment is from Susie Gibald Gibadlo of Cave Creek. Dear Dr. Burdick, it is imperative that our children go back to the classroom and their schools in CCUSD. Be a leader and not a follower as a superintendent and show that CCUSD is doing what is best for the students. Teachers are essential workers and need to perform their jobs or turn in their teaching contracts. Public schools are the only escape from abusive homes for many children. The current medical statistics and facts do not support the school closures. This is being done selfishly by you. Teachers, parents, and kids should have the choice to return to school immediately. Why did our previous votes not matter? You are still calling all of the shots, which is unjust and unfair. Do you realize the damage you are doing to some children by forcing them to be locked in their homes or rooms all day and sit in front of a computer? Kids need social interaction. The need to learn how to function out of the real world setting and not locked inside their room behind a computer with zero interaction to the outside world. They need social interaction to learn to become functioning and effective adults and human beings. This cannot be done the way you are forcing our kids to learn. You are teaching them fear and antisocial behaviors that will be damaging to many of them for months and years to come. And that is time on that comment. The next comment is from Alyssa Bauman of Cave Creek. First off, as a parent with three children in the Cave Creek School District, I would like to say thank you. Thank you for the adjustments you've all made to your lives and your methods of teaching, as well as as we all navigate these uncharted waters together. Specifically in regard to our principal, Mr. Pettinato of Horseshoe Trails, my family has been more than pleased with the communication and support he has provided. We feel confident we can approach our school's administration with concerns and questions, and that is extremely important to us. Having said that, I do have strong concerns about postponing the start of the school year after a few weeks or even months. 
where I agree monitoring numbers of cases in our area is an important factor to consider. There are so many others of equal, if not more, importance, notably the effect distance learning is having on students' psychological and emotional well being. The CDC explicit, explicitly states, quote, extended school closure is harmful to children. It can lead to severe learning loss and the need for in-person instruction is particularly important for students with heightened behavioral needs, end quote. And that is time on that comment. The next comment is from Jennifer Sento of Phoenix. Hello, my name is Jennifer Sento and I'm an English teacher at Cactus Shadows. I am writing to you to ask that you consider the metrics when choosing an in-person learning start day. I ask that we follow Governor Ducey's recommendation of waiting until all three metrics be met for 14 consecutive days before we return. This is the, on, the only truly safe way to return to in-person learning. My classroom is roughly 30 feet by 25 feet, not all of which is usable space. And while I have one of the largest classrooms of my entire department, if I were not give each desk a six foot bubble, I would only be able to fit roughly 17 desks in my room. My largest class has 34 students. The quote social distancing end quote that is being done when desks is only about a foot and a half, which is not enough to keep my students or me safe. For the past three years, I have gladly greeted my students with a bright smile every day at my door. I love being a teacher and I love seeing my students' faces every day. My job is to engage students, implement state and school standards, and most importantly, keep my students safe. That's time on that comment. The next comment is from J Jason and Tersa Cortulo. Dear members of the board, we want to relay our concerns as parents of our two CCUSD daughters, sixth and eighth grade. As we continue to navigate through COVID-19 pandemic as parents, we understand the concerns of our community. However, we are also concerned about the educational and social well-being of our daughters. Online school has been very challenging for our daughters. The lack of structure and human connection that cannot possibly be replaced with a computer is palatable in our home. Our daughters miss connecting with their teachers and their friends. They miss being able to talk and connect in real time. As parents, we foresee the potential damage that prolonging in-person school can bear on our daughters. We plead with you to open up our schools. As a nurse practitioner working in the healthcare field, I have been on the front line since the beginning of this pandemic. I understand fear and uncertainty. Nonetheless, I wake up every day in risk exposure for the better of my patients. This is what you do when one chooses a career in public service. <clears throat> and that is time on that comment. Next comment is from Jason Erickson of Cave Creek. Dear governing board members, I am a parent to a fourth grade student at Black Mountain, a husband to a teacher and a Cave Creek community member for the past 19 years. And I urge the board to vote and adopt the Arizona metrics for a safe reopening to in-person schools. CCUSD is not following the CDC recommendations for social distancing, so follow, following the science and metrics for a safe reopening is especially important for the safety of students, teachers, and community members. Following the metrics will ensure sufficient data is utilized so that the community spread of COVID is mitigated. Further, I encourage the board to follow a delayed opening like the surrounding districts to ours have chosen to do. Additionally, I would encourage the governing board to consider a phased opening to further protect our students, teacher, and community members. I believe moving too quickly will lead to school closures again. The effects of attending school on physical campus and then having to return to distance learning model quickly again is far more harmful to students' emotional well being. Please do what is right. That's time on that comment. <clears throat> the next comment is from Colleen Neese of Cave Creek. Dear Superintendent Burdick and CCUSD board members, I'm writing this letter to express my strong concern about your intention to delay in-person school. You have already delayed it long enough. You prematurely voted to delay it past the August 17th date, but we accepted that decision with the September 8th start date. Now that September 8th is a week away, we should be focusing our attention on getting these kids back in school, not focusing on yet another delay. All of the metrics have been met for in-person school to begin. We are green in all three metrics, although one met metric is mistakenly showing yellow. It's been extremely frustrating to allow our kids' futures to lie in the hands of numbers that aren't being reported correctly. I will state the obvious here. Kids need in-person instruction. Kids need to be around their peers. 
Our kids have been on screens for six months, enough already. Let them live their lives. Those who have fears about their health and safety as it relates to the coronavirus should remain in AOE. You gave us two choices. That's time on those comments. The next comments are from Catherine Fay of Scottsdale. I'm in disbelief that the CCUSD administration has the audacity to recommend another postponement. I don't know, understand why we are even having this discussion again. Please listen to the science and the Maricopa County metrics. When I spoke with Maricopa County Public Health Director's Department, they said do not focus on the colors as they can be incorrect, but rather focus on the numeric metric data and how it aligns to their recommendations. This is received right off their website. Recommendations for resuming in-person learning. MCDPH recommends the following benchmark thresholds be met prior to offering any in-person learning. Cases, two consecutive weeks with new cases rates below 100 per 100,000 people or ADHS has determined that a decline in weekly average cases for two consecutive weeks will also meet the case metric. PCR test percent positivity, two consecutive weeks with less than 7% positivity. COVID-like illness percentage or of hospital visits, two consecutive weeks with percent of hospital visits. And that's time for those comments. <coughs> Excuse me. The next comments are from Devin Glasgow of Cave Creek. While I will be disappointed with anything less than a return to campus on September 8th, I simply cannot understand why Dr. Burdick would propose that even once the metrics are met in person, classes would not resume for more than a week. Schools should already be prepared to welcome students on September 8th. This recommendation is irresponsible and shows a lack of readiness on the part of administrators and teachers. There have been months to, they have been months to prepare for our students' return. Any additional time needed clearly shows that the districts lack, the districts lack urgency to allow a return to campus for those who chose that option. I understand it may take a week to get the school cafeterias up and running, but don't use that as an excuse to delay in-person learning any longer. There is an online option for the families who want or need it. The state already acknowledges a nearly two week delay in their metric and the rest of the community should not be punished any longer. Those are the end of her comments. The next comments are from Melissa Adelson of Cave Creek. Dear CCUS, board. We trust you to keep our children safe. Every day when we send our kids to school, we are trusting you with their lives. Yes, the numbers are encouraging and we are trending in the right direction, but the fact is we have not met the required benchmarks to return to school safely. I am concerned about the lack of safety protocols in place for returning to in-person. Do schools have firm plans in place for the 8th? From what I have heard, there is no clear protocol and what has been suggested is not very encouraging. I am concerned that we will open and in a week or two shut down again. This would be extremely disruptive to the students, families and teachers. If we must shut back down because of cases in the schools, we now are looking at quarantining and possibility of sick teachers, staff and students. Now students are missing instruction and education time. Families are now scrambling again and trying to yet again figure out childcare. Large companies and organizations are all going and staying virtual until the end of the year or longer. These people are grown adults who know how to socially, and those are the uh, time for those comments and Dr. Burdick will continue. The next comment is from Bonnie Daly of Cave Creek. President Hill, Vice President James Rich, members Janet Busby, Scott Brown and Beth Hatcher. I am writing to you as a concerned parent in the Cave Creek Unified School District. I was a parent of two children in the district for nine years. And during that time, I was not only involved in fundraising for each of the three schools my children attended, but I also held various board and committee positions. Today, however, I'm writing to you as a parent of one of your teachers. And I feel that mine is a different voice that should be heard and considered today as you make your decision on when our schools will return to in-person classes. COVID-19 is a serious issue not to be taken lightly. And I know that you and your fellow board members are not taking the situation as such. But I'd like to call your attention to how the district is treating your teachers and what the expectations are for them on a daily basis. You also should know that I'm a caterer with food handlers and certified profession food handlers certification. So I know a bit about contamination and sanitization processes. My daughter was given a spray bottle the other day with a nondescript yellow liquid in it, along with five microfiber cloths. She was told that she and her fellow teachers are to clean each desk. Uh, and that is the end of that comment by time. 
The next comment is from Robert Holt of Cave Creek. I'm in seventh grade at Snorin Trails. I have met new friends in my classes on Zoom and we all hang out together at places like Desert Ridge and have fun. We want the same thing with school. We have never been asked what we want. Dr. Burdick, why have you never asked us? Do we not matter? COVID is COVID. We are not sick and we don't care if we wear masks. We want to be back in school. If my mom and stepdad and my friend's parents let us hang out, then why don't you? Open our school, we deserve more. The next comment is from Shannon Johnson of Scottsdale. Over the last few weeks, I have witnessed my girls attempting online school. There have been many challenges and distractions that they are definitely affecting their learning. Please take this into consideration. These kids need to be back face-to-face -face with teachers and peers for effective learning. Thank you from a concerned parent. The next comment is from Mitzi Palma of Cave Creek. I'm a parent of a junior and sophomore. Both kids are ready for return to school. And as a family, we're ready for taking all precautions necessary according to this board to help make this happen. My daughter had a 4.2 GPA last year and is struggling trying to do online math. She learns math much better when in a classroom environment where she can see the teacher and have the benefits of other kids' questions. She's very stressed out and worried about her grades. Please do whatever you can to help CCUSD come back on September 8, 2020. Thank you for your consideration. The next comment is from Sheila Schaefer of Carefree. I am making the request to open schools as intended on September 8, 2020 as follows. One, the CDC's current data indicates 6% of the 161,392 reported US coronavirus deaths are directly related to COVID-19. Deaths by COVID solely without other primary medical condition, conditions is at 9,683. This data revision demonstrates COVID as a secondary or tertiary occurrence and other medical reasons are primarily causal in the balance of these cases. Two, at this point, it can be argued it's more harmful keeping children from school socialization, face-to-face -face education, mental health and emotional health and well-being are impacted. Three, CCUSD potential funding loss. Chandler School District lost 21 million due to student attendance and parents taking their children elsewhere. Article in Santan Sun Times. They missed their student projections. I want to see CCUSD flourish. And that is time for that comment. The next comment is from Dana Smalley of Scottsdale. I am the parent of two children that attend school in CCUSD. My sixth grade student is in the first Mandarin immersion class at Horseshoe Trails. We've invested years into Mandarin program and we are now forced between two very poor options, risk our health and our lives to continue Mandarin or leave Horseshoe Trails. Both my sixth grade child and I have underlying health issues that put us at risk of getting seriously ill from exposure to COVID-19. We would love to stay with the Mandarin Immersion Program and stay with the class that's been together since kinder. However, the risks associated with the return to in-person learning are not tolerable. We all acknowledge that the in-person learning is best for the kids, but at what cost? Will my child be better off if he contracts COVID-19 and brings it home? What long-term health consequences would she suffer should she get sick and survive? If she loses a parent or grandparent, will we think it was all worth it? My concerns also include the faculty and staff of our schools. What death rate of our teachers is an acceptable death rate? I implore you to continue online learning. That is time for that comment. The next comment is from Scott Levine of Phoenix. Dear CCUSD board members and superintendent, Dr. Burdick, I'm writing you today as a veteran teacher of 18 years in the district. During this time, I have not only watched my own children graduate from Cactus Shadows, but also the children of over half the current board members. I am proud to be a part, not only of the school district, but the community as a whole. And I look forward to continuing my service as an educator and mentor, however, Times have changed drastically in the last six months. We're entering new unexplored territory as stakeholders in this community. Given this and the facts, I implore you to defer those who are best equipped to make the decisions regarding returning to live instruction. We must listen to medical professionals and the scientific community during these difficult times. We must follow the prescribed guidelines of green, green, green for consecutive weeks before we even consider coming back. As someone who misses and longs for interaction with his students and colleagues, I understand what a difficult decision this is and I understand the logic of using a hybrid or phase in model. My concern is do these options effectively require funding and support? And that is the time for that comment. The next comment is from Abby Albrecht of Phoenix. 
Dear CCUSD board, Dr. Burdick and all others, this may concern. My children have been learning online with their Desert Willow teachers since the start of school and have been handling it better than expected. This is by no small part of their amazing and prepared teachers. As much as I would like to see them physically back in class, furthering their education and socializing, which has been greatly missed, I would like you to consider pushing the in-person start date back. I know there is a strain on families of parents that work out of the home. I understand the complexity of your decision, but quite simply, the metrics have not been met. It seems counterintuitive to open school to have it closed when the virus runs through classrooms. I have the utmost faith in our staff and teachers, although I do believe it's difficult to account for every child, their family beliefs and children who are too young to understand and act appropriately, or children who may not care. Why put our population, including teachers and staff at risk? In closing, I'm aware that many districts surrounding ours have pushed, consider their logic and follow suit. Thank you for your time. The next comment is from Haley Vago Phoenix. Dear governing board members, I write to you today to encourage the adoption of the Arizona Department of Health Services metrics for a safe reopening. Your support of these metrics has would not only ensure teachers peace of mind, but it's necessary for the safety of students. CCUSD has prioritized health and safety, high quality teaching and learning, timely communication and physical, social, emotional needs as the pillars for returning with excellence. And it is imperative we keep these as main priorities. I want members to know that I want to be teaching in person. Teaching online has posed new struggles every day and increased my daily workload immensely. However, teaching online only requires me to focus on one thing, teaching. If returning to school, is such a high priority, the level of teaching will unfortunately suffer. Adding more policies, procedures, and tasks to our already overloaded list of responsibilities as educators without proper guidance or training will set us up for failure. Implementing a phased reopening will help keep safety and high quality education top priorities without bombarding teachers. That is time on that comment. The next comment is from Melissa Gress of Cave Creek. Data from MCDPH indicates Cave Creek Unified School District meets the criteria for hybrid learning with on-site support and Maricopa County is on track to meet all three benchmarks in the next few days for in-person learning. Can you please explain to all the parents that you have chosen the in-person option why you would go against the recommendation from MCDPH benchmarks? Number two, also, Cave Creek Unified School District has had the last six months to prepare for in-person learning. Can you please explain why there could be any possible delay to delay other than benchmarks? And three, what are the benchmarks to judge the efficacy of online learning? And those complete those comments and Dr. Pratt will continue. The next comment is from John Crago from Phoenix. Dear members of the board, I would first like to publicly thank all the hard work and efforts put in by our school's teachers, educators, and staff during this crazy time. As a parent with two children at Horseshoe Trails, I am grateful. Second, I would like for the board to consider the practical benefits of a return to in-person learning. Some of these benefits include social interaction, social learning, increased interaction with teachers, as well as improved mental health across the board for students, teachers, and parents. At home, who parents at home who are trying to juggle work along with education responsibilities. With decreased numbers in COVID cases and increased number of businesses opening back up, I believe now is the time for our schools to return. We can do so wisely, safely, and with the support from our community. Thank you. That is the end of that comment. The next comment from, is from Kathleen Roberson from Phoenix. I would like to thank the governing board for their hard work and difficult work trying to establish a safe and healthy pathway for returning to in-person instruction in school this year. As a parent, I am not ready to send my elementary child age kids back to school. If school is reopened for in-person instruction on September 8th, my children will not return. While distance learning is not ideal, their awesome teachers at Desert Willow are handling remote learning with creativity and grace. The positive attitudes of their teachers have engaged my children and they are still excited to see them and go to school each day. On the other hand, I don't believe it is possible to create and maintain an environment that will keep them or teachers or other staff safe in their for in-person instruction. As a teacher, I do not feel safe returning to my class classroom either. I respectfully encourage the board to delay the reopening of our schools at a minimum until the metrics set by the Department of Health are met and ideally until a vaccine is widely available and it is truly safe to return. That is the end of those comments. 
The next comments come from Destiny, Destiny Voida from Cave Creek. As a parent of a first and fourth grader in our CCUSD, I firmly believe now it is now is not the time to return to in-person brick and mortar learning. We are currently enrolled in the distance learning option with an eventual return to brick and mortar. At first I resisted, but I have come to embrace and appreciate the distance learning our teachers are providing our children, all in the pursuit of safety. For those of us who have not yet contracted the virus, it remains a potent, a potent ex existential threat to our livelihood uh, and our loved ones. You hear and read it over and again. Once you become sick, nothing else in the world matters except your health. You cannot bring back a human life from death, but you can catch a human being up to speed in regards to education. For someone who has witnessed the pain and suffering in our community of losing a loved one to this virus, I encourage you to remember the following. You, the CCUSD governing board, could potentially decide the fate of whether a child, parent, or grandparent falls victim to a life-threatening virus. That is the end due to time. Uh, the next comment is from Andrew Kane from Phoenix. In consideration of the metrics presented under this agenda item, I would like to encourage the CCUSD board to also consider the intangible effects of a substantial virtual with online support scenario. As I'm sure has been stated many times in many forums across a variety of shared mediums, a forced non-traditional learning environment for our children is not an acceptable new normal or way of life. There will be generational consequences if we continue this path. In some ways, children and parents will adapt. And in others ways, there will be irreparable harm that we, we will that we have yet to see or understand. We are willing to succumb to fear over creating a responsible plan for our children's return and supplying the resources to get there. Waiting for the green is like chasing unicorns. Our numbers continue to decline. Our curve continues to flatten, yet we don't meet the unattainable standard. And with the reopening of many community gathering places, movie theaters, gyms, et cetera, that our children frequent, how will it ever become more attainable than the past couple of months? And that is the end due to time for, for those comments. The next uh, comment is from Vanessa, Van, Vanessa Clifton from Cave Creek. Good evening, President Hill, members of the board and Dr. Burdick. My name is Vanessa Clifton and I have three children who are at this time former CSUSD students. We found ourselves faced with the difficult situation that every parent has been coping with over the last several months. What is right, the right choice for our children for the fall? For us, the right choice fell outside CSUSD. I pray that this decision remains a temporary one. Our family has been deeply ingrained in the CSUSD community for the last seven years, and we want nothing more than to return to schools and staff with we have grown to love so dear. We, I, will, I would respectfully request a reevaluation of the return to school metric data that impacts our district. I find there to be conflicting information provided by Arizona Department of Health Services. We are all aware that the return to in-person learning is measured by three metrics involving the number of cases, potential po positivity and COVID-like illness statistics. I feel like it is important to note that the metrics that determine the red, yellow, and green status do not match. Okay. I'm sorry, that ends that comment with time for time. The next comment is Steve Weiss from Scottsdale. Please consider supporting the administration's recommendation to follow the state metrics and benchmarks of green, green, green. The safety of our kids and teachers should be top priority. The numbers are looking better every day. It should not be too much longer. Years from now, no one is going to remember whether we opened on September 9th or October 9th but they will remember if we made a decision that rushed the kids back to campus too soon and then it backfires. The teachers and administration, administrators have done a great job on the temporary online version of school. The kids are on a schedule and with their teachers and classmates on Zoom. While it may not be perfect under the circumstances, it's certainly acceptable for a temporary period of time. In addition, other schools are reopening around the valley. So, so we have the opportunity to watch what happens with them. That should answer a lots of questions. That is the end of that comment. The next comment is from, and I apologize if I mispronounced, Zuhair Bajat, Bajat um, from Scottsdale. I have a couple of questions. One, the number of students in my daughter's classes range from 25 to 39 students. If every student wanted to attend school in person, how is the social distancing in classrooms going to be enforced? I don't think the classes are big enough for that. Two, is the hybrid 
school attending an option, i.e. students with last names A through K, for example, attends Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, while the rest of the class attends Tuesdays and Thursdays. Then in the following week, the students swap days. Is this option being entertained? Number three, it is important for kids to attend school for socialization purposes, but at the same time, it is more important to be safe. What kind of balance are you planning to discuss? Regards. That is the uh, end of that comment. Uh, the next comment is from Caden Thomas from Cave Creek. My name is Caden Thomas. I'm in eighth grade at Snorin Trails. I think school should still start on September 8th and not extend to October 12th for many reasons. The first reason that I don't want it to it extended is because I want to be able to socialize with all my friends in school and go back to learning in person and being a part of school sports. Secondly, is that during Zoom classes, the teacher starts to cut out and it's very hard to hear. The teacher and everyone in the class freezes up and it is just really annoying for it to happen to me. And I'm pretty sure it happens to a lot of other students as well every single day. Third, I am starting to get really claustrophobic online. Whereas if we are in person, I would know what to do most of the time because that is what I'm used to. Fourth, some things are just really confusing online. Whereas in person, if we were in person, I would know what to do. Fifth, some teachers have noise going on in the background and they still wind up teaching through it but it is really frustrating because they don't stop it and it's very hard to concentrate if we were in class that wouldn't be happening and that is the end for time on that comment the next comment is from rod and joad joanne parodies from cave creek i am grateful that we have this option and opportunity to email in any comments we would like to have heard at the school board meetings most importantly, the one scheduled for tonight. So for that, I want to say thank you. I also want to say thank you to those who serve our community in this way and who set up, step up to run and be elected as representatives of our, our community, and in particular, our youth and our education and their education. However, it unfortunately feels like I'm writing this email in vain, it, that all decisions have already been made and tonight's meeting is just to follow procedure and that individual comments or thoughts will be read and not necessarily heard. I hope this is not the case. I hope those who was voting and making decisions will take themselves back in time to when their children were young and impressionable. It is easy as we each go through different stages of parenting to become consumed in the stage we are currently in and that which directs, directly impacts our daily lives and that of our children. Such as when our children were infants or toddlers, we knew that commitment and sacrifice necessary. And we all know, oh, I'm, and that, this is the end for time on that comment. The next comment is from Ron and Bridget Decker from uh, Cave Creek. In response to Agenda 4.2, whether in-person schooling should be delayed, we as parents of first grade twins have concerns. First, we chose this school district based on the language immersion offerings. They're both in one of the immersion programs, which means that, that half their day is in the language and that neither they nor my husband or I understand. We feel that this type of program requires children to be in an immersed face-to-face -face environment for them to fully grasp and advance in their language abilities. This is unique to other school districts. Again, one of the main reasons we chose CCUSD schools. Secondly, we as a family are personally struggling and I know we are not alone with the loss of face-to-face in-service resource programs that our son is eligible for and not has not received since March. The online weekly meetings do not accomplish what the in-person hands-on meetings do. There is a reason school starts at age five for all kids, but there's also a need for some to receive extra support in strengthening their social and emotional intelligence. We chose, okay, and that is the end of comments due to time. And Mrs. Scotto will take it from here. President Hill, that concludes the comments for item 4.2. Okay, so thank you. Um, it is 8.42, we are gonna take a five minute break. We'll come back at 8.47, 8.48, depending on how all of our, co our computers, uh, I'm just, uh, 8.48. Um, so you have five and a half minutes. Um, I would suggest that those of us that are on this call, please mute your video and also turn off your video and mute your uh, microphone for the time being. We will resume at 8.48. It is 8.48, let me just see real quick. Um, we have three, four, 
Wait on one board, more board member to click on video. And I see Dr. Warwick. Uh, President Hill. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to get on and it's saying it, I can't start the video because the host has stopped it. Okay. So I'm not sure how to get back on. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're all back. We ready? Okay. Item 4.2. Consideration of the Maricopa County Department of Public Health, MCDPH, metrics for a safe return to in-person school presented by Dr. Burdick. Um, and everyone, again, while there's a presentation, just please mute to keep paper down and then I'll let everyone know when to pop back on. Thank you, President Hill, governing board members and those that are listening on YouTube. At the governing board special meeting on July 20th, the governing board approved a return to in-person school for September 8th, 2020. Since that time, the Arizona Department of Health Services and Maricopa County Department of Public Health have designed metrics to guide a safe opening of schools. The metrics are two weeks below 100 cases per 100,000, not including the current week, two weeks with percent positivity below 7%, not including the current week, and two weeks with hospital visits due to COVID-like illnesses below 10%. Currently, the metrics show CCUSD as yellow on metric one, green on metric two, and green on metric three. We're greatly appreciative that the Maricopa County Department of Public Health was able to provide benchmarks drilled down to the district level, as well as zip code level, in order to use data that the medical professionals in our state deemed acceptable for a safe opening. The dashboards updated every Thursday for the data covering a two week period ending 12 days earlier. And I wanna go back to what I read in the beginning of this paragraph. Um, if you look at the past week, it was yellow, green, green. However, um, if you go back to look at the previous two weeks, it was yellow, yellow, green. Additional CCUSD specific information is that our 683 out of district students or 14% of them live in 42 zip codes. Out of those 42 zip codes, one is green, 29 are in the yellow and 10 are in the red. Two zip codes show no results. Our 379 staff members who do not live in our boundaries or 42% of our staff live in 68 other zip codes 23 of those zip codes are in the red, 45 are in the yellow, and eight showed no results. Although all school class sizes average within the targets for class loading at all schools, Cactus Shadows High School has 20% of their sections with over 30 students in 5% of their teachers' classrooms, which does not allow for physical distancing. There is a writer named Ralph Marston, and he wrote, you always have the opportunity to make a good decision, yet you'll rarely be able to make a perfect decision. And this, of course, is never more evident than now as we undertake this extremely difficult decision. And so I would like to show a PowerPoint before making the um, actual motion. So I know the board has seen this in their packet, and we are going to share it on the screen. So if we go to the second page of the PowerPoint, you can see here that these are um, the Arizona Department of Health Services um, benchmarks for minimal, moderate, and substantial. So minimal community spread is the evidence of isolated cases or limited community transmission, case investigations underway, no evidence of exposure in a large communal setting, that would be green. You can see moderate community spread or yellow, sustained transmission with high likelihood or confirmed exposure within communal settings and potential for rapid increase in cases. And then you can see the substantial or red, substantial community spread is large scale control community transmission including communal settings, such as in schools and workplaces. 
and the Arizona Department of Health Services further defines community spread levels within the thresholds that um, you see below. The next slide shows us also metrics from the Arizona Department of Health Services. It's just another way to show the data. You can see um, the benchmark for two weeks below 100 cases per 100,000 is the first graph. It says or a decline in weekly average cases for two consecutive weeks. Although the Maricopa County Department of Public Health told us to use the first benchmark, they felt that was um, more conducive to safety for public school districts. The percent positivity is the middle benchmark, two weeks with percent positivity below 7%, not including the current week, and they would advise then to go to hybrid. And then the last one is COVID-like illness or two weeks with hospital visits due to COVID-like illness below 10%. And you can see listed the different data sources there. On to the next slide. Dr. Burdick, can I interrupt real quick? Sure. We are at uh, 8.54. We're definitely not gonna be done before nine o'clock and per our protocol, we need to take a vote to move to extend this meeting past nine o'clock. Do I have a motion to extend? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, okay so I'll second. Um, so we have a motion. We need to move to extend this meeting past nine o'clock. Um, member uh, Rich? Aye. I'm an I. Hatcher? Yeah, uh, I. Um, Usby? I. Brown? I. Okay. Sorry, Dr. Burdick. That's okay. The next slide is going to show the dates that are being used for the um, metrics that are being displayed by the county and the state benchmarks. So I need the next slide. There we go. So you can see if you look at the dashboard update, and these, this dashboard is updated every Thursday, typically after 4 p.m., that if you look at August 27th, which was last Thursday, the date time period used was August 2nd through 8th and August 9th through 15th. There is a 12 day lag when they do show us the current dashboard for the week on a Thursday. And that is why you've heard some districts say that they're delaying a few weeks before going back um, because they are um, using the suggestion that was made by the Maricopa Department of Public Health to remember that there is a 12 day lag. And if they go back too soon after seeing the two week benchmark it could mean that the information could change again before they actually go back. And then you see September 3rd, which will be this coming Thursday. And the data that will be posted then is August 9th through 15th and August 16th through August 22nd. So again, accounting for a 12 day lag there. The next slide talks about additional considerations for offering in-person instruction. A lot of this is gonna be repetitive. So the Arizona Department of Health Services said the following benchmarks must, must be met prior to offering traditional in-person. So cases, two-week decline, again, uh, percent positively, to positivity, positivity, excuse me, we've had to do a lot of talking tonight, two weeks with less than 7% for hybrid, and it would be less than 5% for everyone going back like normal. COVID-like illness syndromic surveillance is two weeks with hospital visits due to COVID-like illnesses below 10%. The next slide are recommendations from our county. Again, they say use our county website for data sourcing to see the metrics. Use the district boundaries or average if impacted zip codes are over the county. And so we've been using our district zip codes, full in-person on-site learning for green, which is below 5% for two weeks, and consult the Maricopa Department of Public Health for classroom site or district closures, which we've had many people ask us, what will you do if the metrics start to go back? And so the health department has said for us to monitor them and to contact them. The next slide shows our district. So you can see the bluish outline, hard to see on this slide, but um, in the middle of the screen, 
that is our uh, school district and the miles from the um, northern part of the district down to the very southern point and of course east to west. And you can see that from the last week it is yellow. The next slide is the one that most of us are using very um, often to see what the benchmarks are. So there was a glitch in the system, which was very frustrating last week. I was finally able um, after getting, um, I want to compliment the Maricopa Department of Public Health for not only answering my phone call and staying on the phone for 45 minutes until they could determine what was wrong, but also then following it up with actual written email from Dr. Scott from the Maricopa Department of Public Health. So we were able to get the glitch fixed. So what you see here is for the past week, again, this is 12 days back, um, we were yellow for cases per 100,000 people, green for percent positivity, and green for COVID-like illness. However, we've been asked to look at two weeks. So if you go to the second half, you see that at the two week data, and I had showed you the dates for those um, on the previous slide, cases per 100,000 people were 32.83 and still yellow. Percent positivity was 5.5% and yellow and COVID-like illness was 3% in green. So my recommendations then on the next slide are to use the 14 day average for data collection on the website, prioritize our district boundary data as opposed to using county or just zip codes, use the same data source and analysis for comparisons throughout this process and throughout the weeks as we've been doing. Again, look for the positivity rate uh, two for week average, two week average at less than 5%, which we now have uh, for one week, a two week average for less than 10 cases per 100,000, and a two week average of COVID like less than 5% combination of percent of hospital and ER visits, which we also have in the green. Decisions for closures of classrooms, buildings, or district would be in consultation in the future with our administration and the Maricopa Department of Public Health per the board resolution that the board approved on July 20th. So what that means, if all of a sudden there was a spike of cases or we have two cases in a school where the students are not typically in the same classrooms, uh, we are to give that information to the health department and they will help us decide whether or not after doing backtracing, we would need to close the school or perhaps just some classrooms. And then full safety protocols implemented across all the sites until clearance from the health department. And those would be our mitigation or logistics plan that um, the board saw um, months ago that we put together and it's posted on our website. And so at this point, I'd like to make the motion. So the administration would recommend that the governing board take the following action, return to school for in-person learning using the Maricopa County Department of Public Health metrics for CCUSD when the metrics show green, green, green for the three Maricopa County Department of Public Health benchmarks for the Cape Creek Unified School District. School would resume one week from the Monday following the Thursday update to the metrics in order to prepare for in-person learning. If the metrics are not green, green, green by the end of the first quarter, I would want the board to place a reopening date item on the October 12th governing board meeting. Do we have a, do we have a motion? So moved. Second. All right, discussion. Can I ask a question before um, uh, discussion begins? Um, Dr. Burdick, based on some of the emails that we've heard tonight, uh, particularly from staff, and based on what's occurred in other districts, do, does the district office have any knowledge as to whether or not teachers may resign 
based on tonight's vote? Have you heard anything? So President Hill and Member Hatcher, governing board members, I asked because of anticipation that this may be a question, um, that the principals today touch each of their teachers in some way, whether a uh, survey monkey survey or calls or emails anonymously so that, or only to the principals. So the teachers would feel like it would be in confidence with the principal to um, say whether or not they would return if we return on September 8th or not, as well as if not, what date or dates would they deem acceptable and just trying to get some information. And so 62% of our teachers said they would return. 38% of our teachers said they would not. Those that said they would not, the uh, largest groups to um, of what they were hoping for, 33% um, of those were looking for the metrics to be met and 8% of them were looking at some date in October. And the next highest was 2% that wanted to use the CDC guidelines. Okay, um, thank you. And that was with 87% of our teachers, certified teachers responding. Um, I know, I guess my question is, I know we had, um, it's been discussed, cleaning protocols mentioned and, and outlined in July. Have there been made any additions, subtractions made to the cleaning protocols that have been discussed? Yes, um, because um, we know that um, there have been some questions over the materials being used or teachers having time to do some of the cleaning protocols. Uh, we actually decided today to maybe move in a different direction with a significant cost. Um, but it would certainly guarantee that the protocols were followed. So I know we have Mr. Santina and Mr. Leedy on the line or on the call. And so um, Mr. Leedy, what would be your preference for responding to that new, new look and new um, ideas for cleaning? Um, okay, thank you, Dr. Burdick, uh, President Hill, members of the board. Um, we did check, we, we had a meeting with um, ABM custodial services today, and they do have a program that uh, we, that well, let me let me back up just a second. We're, we were looking at the protocols and trying to figure out logistically how we could get the surfaces cleaned adequately for uh, students that were changing classes. And so we had a discussion with ABM. ABM has got a program that's uh, it's called. Um, Let's see, help me, Mike. What's the what's the name of the program? I, I can't remember what they were talking about now, but um, anyway, uh, it's a, it's a new program that they've got that um, they bring in additional staff, and there will be staff uh, at each site each day that will uh, take care of the touch points. They'll bring in hand sanitation, uh, sanitizing stations. They'll provide wipes and uh, that we can wipe down the surfaces with because what we were running into with the waxy product was the dwell time on the surfaces. And it was taking, uh, it could take up to 10 minutes, which was problematic for the class time uh, passing. And so we, we ordered wipes and then we'll have those on site uh, for when school does start. Uh, but then we would have ABM come in and uh, assist with the electrostatic cleaning at night and also cleaning all touch point services, restrooms, common areas uh, during the during the daytime. And the idea was that we were going to um, apply for the funding for that from the uh, DEMA funding. <clears throat> so does that, does that eliminate um, the the teacher cleaning desks between the, the each change in class. Yeah, the, does that eliminate the spraying of the desks and the teacher physically cleaning every single desk where uh, in which a student sits? However many times a new class comes in, it doesn't, does it? 
That, uh, I, I don't think so. Well, for the elementary grades, uh, certainly they're not going to have to do it uh, because of the classes staying uh, together all day. They could do it uh, at specials, at, at lunch, uh, so they could spray as needed, but uh, they will sanitize at night. So when, after they leave, the higher grades can use the wipes to uh, wipe down their uh, surfaces when they come back, when they come into class, because that only has a one minute uh, dwell time to kill the virus. So And, and so, um, Member Hatcher and Governing Board members, the name of the ABM program is called the Enhanced Cleaning Program. Right. And it would not, um, uh, it wouldn't take the place of desks being wiped down for secondary students who change every period. But what it would do is allow the students to do the wiping with a um, wipe rather than the teacher having to spray and then use the spray, which is not recommended for children under a certain age to use. And so it takes um, responsibility of the student to use that wipe to clean the desk before they leave for the next class or the next student to wipe down that desk when they first come in. And so part of this program, the enhanced cleaning program allows us to have wipes as part of the program. Good, good, That's, that is fantastic. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. I, actually, I have a question, but I also want to make a comment. Um, going back to the uh, survey that Dr. Burdick was referencing, um, I'm a little. The information is good but I'm a little concerned about how it was acquired because I know that teachers were sent an email that said board members are asking for a staff survey. I didn't realize that we were asking for a staff survey. So um, member Busby, I had a board member ask if that was possible. I was going to do that anyway. I asked the board today or the principals today if they thought they could get it done by the end of the day and they were able to get me the information by five o'clock. I thought it might be helpful for the governing board. So if they uh, principals misunderstood what I asked them, I apologize. Okay. Um, you know, I, we are definitely in a very unprecedented time. And in the amount of time that I have spent on the board, there has never been an issue that has um, activated, motivated, or, or received so many public comments as this one. And one of the things that I would love to encourage is that the, the passion that has been uh, voiced and displayed over the last several weeks and months regarding when we're going back to school. I, I really encourage parents to continue to stay actively involved because that involvement is essential to how we move forward. And it takes everybody working together as a team to meet the goal. It's not just our teachers, it's just not the kid in the classroom, it's everybody working together. Um, with, with that said, um, I know that there's not an absolute right answer to this because regardless of how the, how the question is answered, it's not gonna make everybody happy. And as I've thought about this, many, many times. The one thing that I think this board failed to do was um, demand that the district actively be working on some kind of a hybrid model. Now, I know Dr. Burdick had said that the, the back to school committee had looked at all kinds of options and some kind of a hybrid model just wasn't going to work for logistics or whatever various reasons. But 
knowing that this is a very divided issue and people have very legitimate reasons for not wanting to go back into a classroom and and I respect that but then there are also people who have very legitimate reasons for wanting back in the classroom and not that we can be all things to all people but the board really I believe should have asked that there be some more investigation because if we have options, that opens the door for more opportunities. And right now, the only opportunity we have is a Zoom classroom or AOI, and that's it. It's all or none. There is there is no plan on the table for any kind of a phased in going back to school. There wasn't a discussion of, oh, well, if we're going to open up school, let's let's take the AP honors and ID students and let them go into Cactus Shadows first to slowly work in. We didn't do any of that. And that's, that, that's, that should have come from the board. And so I apologize to the community. We didn't do that. And that was part of our job. Um, with, with that said, some of these comments were very, very concerning. We've had a number of, of teachers um, voice very valid concerns. They're concerned about um, not being able to social distance and you know their classroom is too small and they can't social distance. I get that, I've been in a lot of the classrooms but at the same time, when I see photographs of teachers at social gatherings and barbecues, and they're not social distancing, they're standing shoulder to shoulder, and they're not wearing face masks, they're at the lake, and they're not social distancing, and then they come and submit comments and say that they're worried about uh, getting infected because we can't social distance. And I see actions that are contrary to those words. That, that's concerning to me. And it, makes me, it gets me very confused because I don't understand. When I, when I ha see teachers I see them out in public and yes, you got to go to the grocery store, or you got to go here, or you got to go there. But when teachers are hanging out at the lake and they're going to barbecues and social distancing is not part of the equation. And then they're coming and saying they don't want to go back into the classroom because of their concerns about health. That seems like that's a contradiction. And it makes it very difficult to, to make a very valid and authentic decision here when I, I see contradictions. Um, President Hill, um, may I respond to the hybrid situation? Sure. <clears throat> sure, thank you. President Hill and Member Busby and other governing board members, our return to school team did examine hybrid and our principals and other education leaders in the district looked at viable options, possible viable options for hybrid because it was what was um, suggested as part of the Arizona Department of Education suggestions for what school would look like. I wanted to just share some of the concerns that I have had about hybrid and why I wouldn't recommend it. So number one, uh, the one that was deemed to be the most likely would have had eight to L students going to school on Monday, Tuesday, and then the M through Z students going to school on Wednesday, Thursday, and the Friday would be the day that the teachers were planning the asynchronous lessons for the students that were not in their active physical classrooms. And so what that did is it gave to the students only two days out of five of actual 
instruction with a teacher. The third day or the, the actual other three days that they weren't face to face with the teacher at school would be back to the asynchronous learning style that we had last spring. And I didn't feel that two days of instruction out of five with three days of asynchronous learning instead of synchronous learning or in-person learning would be um, advantageous to our students learning what they needed to learn in a week of school because we were almost cutting down a third of the learning time. And by the end of the year or however long we would use this model, our students would be very far behind. So always trying to think of the students' education and of course their safety as number one. But I felt like this was an inferior education. The second thing that was a concern for me, and I checked with some of our education lobbyists and actually a state senator on this, was last spring, the 180 day requirement of actual student attendance with a teacher was forgiven because we were in asynchronous learning. And the legislature suggested forgiving that and the governor signed it. From what I've heard, the legislature may not go back till January, which would be half of our year. And from what I heard, there was no guarantee depending on elections that the legislature that would be in place would forgive the 180 day requirement. That would mean we could lose significant funding. So I was concerned about that. It could happen, but we don't know that for sure. My third concern was, although we have um, parents who have felt that there are teachers that aren't working enough, from what I'm hearing from most of our principals are that teachers are working extra long hours beyond the school day, trying to do office hours with students, answer student questions, answer parent questions, take parent phone calls. And many of the principals have said their teachers are working 12 hour days. I could not see now adding to that for the teachers an additional component which would be planning for asynchronous learning. And finally, my last concern was that we are required, if we do hybrid, to continue on-site learning support. We have 169 students right now at six of our school sites who are in on-site learning support, a requirement in order for us to try to get some of the funding that is available as grants through the state. And we are not allowed to turn anyone away. And so if we had students A through L on Monday, Tuesday, the students who would be um, not in school, the M through Z students are eligible now for on-site on learning on those two days and vice versa for the A through L. And everybody would be eligible on Friday. So three days a week, students would be eligible for on-site learning at one of our schools. Our concern with that is the people that are supervising the on-site learning right now are our bus drivers, our paras, some of our aides that aren't being used in the regular classroom support on Zoom, as well as some of our child nutrition staff, some of our administrative assistants, and if school would resume face-to-face -to -face for four days a week, even though half the students would be there two days, half the students on the other two days, those folks would now be doing their regular jobs. And we have no staff left. Um, I had somebody suggest to me, uh, another superintendent, well, put all of your, your teaching coaches in there. And I said, well, we don't have teaching coaches in our district. And others have suggested other positions that we don't have in Cape Creek. We're pretty lean and mean. And right now we've been able to support on-site learning with staff, but once we go back to, if it would be hybrid, we have the on-site learning requirements still, but we no longer have the staff available to supervise it. So those are the challenges that would be present with hybrid learning. Um, Dr. Burdick, 
um, thank you for your input. You know, when I mentioned or said that it would have been nice for the board to have an opportunity, you know, we are in a situation where nobody's, nobody's going to get 100% of what they want because this is, this is an unprecedented time. And I would venture to guess that our community is well aware of there's give and take in a situation. And I know that special ed is the only required group for transportation. Um, things like transportation, if a parent had to decide between sending their student to school um, because of bus, you know, or if, if they had to give up bus transportation, but that meant that they could have their kid in school. I, I'm venturing to guess that there's probably a number of parents that would opt for that. And our, our families are aware that we've got to do some things differently. And that it's just unfortunate that there wasn't an open discussion, a brainstorming that really involved, you know, asking the board what we thought, bringing in community members. You've, you've created committees to brainstorm about all kinds of things. And there wasn't any kind of uh, true brainstorming. I know you had your group within the district that, that worked on this. And I, and I hats off to everybody because there was a lot of time involved in it and there was a lot of effort, but you know, there's, and it's not a perfect situation. So I'm not like slamming anybody. I'm just saying that there's more that we could have done to help mitigate where we're at now. Um, you know, there was a survey that was done early on. 80% of the respondents said they wanted their kid back, in, their children back in school. But once we got the report, nothing really ever went anywhere as far as the board's concerned. Okay, great, we've got a report. 80% of these students want to be back in a classroom. And that was it. Your, your group came and brought their, their suggestions and that was the end of it. So then what? Nothing happened. You're giving your explanations of reasons why a hybrid wouldn't work. And one of the things that stands out, it keeps coming back to the money. And it's unfortunate that it sounds like, you know, we're, we're more concerned about what kind of money we're gonna get than how we're gonna educate these kids. And I know they go hand in hand. You can't educate them if you don't have the money. But to, to use that as an excuse is really unfortunate. Um, and it's, it, it, it's just really unfortunate. You know, at this point, we're sending kids to EVIT. Sports teams are practicing. Um, yet we can't open up a classroom, but it's okay for the baseball team to have practice and it's okay and it's safe and Cape Creek condones kids going to eat it. I haven't heard anybody say, oh gee, we haven't opened our district, so it's not safe for our kids to go to eat it. How come it's safe for them to go to eat it, but it's not safe for, for them to be on a Cape Creek campus? Um, uh, can I just respond to that? Um, sorry, Member Hatcher. And Member Busby, of course, as the board knows from communications I've sent to you, um, EVIT um, decided they're a separate school district that we're lucky to be a part of for certain students who are juniors and seniors. And they decided to open on the 17th because they felt that students could not learn their on-hands programs unless they were actually in attendance. So that, that is why. And then our sports teams that have been practicing have been practicing with many um, mitigation efforts that have been sanctioned by the AIA. So it's not like everybody's full out practice. Although um, this week they did move to full, um, 
full tryouts, practice wearing masks, and with um, five ball rotations for volleyball, football cannot have full practice unless it is um, a group of 50 and they're still having mitigation. And um, the weight room can all be, only be used of small groups of five or 10. So there still are mitigation efforts going on with sports. And we're very happy that this optional program of sports is allowed for students whose parents choose that option. It is not for every student. Um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about um, the recommendation and uh, the research that I did, which will lead me to my vote whenever we do that. Um, when I took a dive into those numbers, uh, the case number is really very close to zero. Uh, so for me, when I was comparing from week to week, um, that number really didn't matter to me, to be honest with you, that that was yellow. Uh, I, in my research this weekend, I have uh, been in contact with four doctors and I wanted to make sure I was interpreting that cor correctly. And one of them actually said, uh, that's about as close to nothing as you can get, because I wanted to know if that was medically significant. So, I began drilling down into the next two numbers. And the positivity, all these numbers inform decisions, and I realize that. But percent positivity, um, to, for me, the flaw in that number is that we don't know how many people are tested. So it's a percent positive out of the number of people tested. We don't know how many people are tested and the framework in which those people are tested. And by that, I mean the zip code or the county. Uh, so the number is important, but yet um, it, was, it was a little hard for me to wrap my head around it because of what I just said. And then of course, COVID like illness has remained at three now for a while, which is a Maricopa County number. Um, so I have a lot of stuff, but I'm not going to go into all of it. Um, I am not in favor of pushing school to, uh, opening into October. Um, when I look at these numbers, the statistics show that we're going down. The trend is to go down and I pay attention to trends. Um, the trend is moving in the right direction and the numbers look good to me. Um, as I listened to all of the emails and read the emails, things came to my mind that I had not thought of before. I realized that uh, families that don't wanna go in and teachers that don't wanna go in and staff that don't wanna go in, it, it's because of safety. Um, however, I think about the mental safety of the kids. And while COVID could possibly uh, harm someone, could possibly kill someone, so can depression. Um, my daughter's good friend committed suicide a few years ago. I had a student when I was a third grade teacher. I found out my student in middle school tried to commit suicide as a middle school student. So what I'm saying is that there's a chance that COVID could do that, but there's also a chance that depression can do that with our kids. So both have the risk of death. And that's a huge concern to me. Um, I am very much concerned about time kids spend on the computer. I, I was concerned about that when I taught. That hasn't changed. Um, in my research about on the brain and technology, we know that an overuse of technology rewires the brain. We know that 
children and adults can become addicted to technology. And the younger the person is, the easier they can become addicted to technology. Uh, they can become depressed from the overuse of technology. And then we get back to what I was saying before, is that there's a possibility that could lead to suicide. The middle school and high school are already vulnerable. It's, they're vulnerable, it's a vulnerable age group. So that's a huge concern to me. And when I listen to this, really listened to it read to me versus me reading it, it really hit home that, yes, I acknowledge the teacher and um, parent fear of the possibility of severe illness and death. But I also acknowledge the fact that depression can lead to death via suicide. So um, I, I would not be able to support bumping school start date out into October. Um. Oh, sorry, Beth, were you still going? No, I'm done. Uh, I, I have um, a, a well, can question. I say something? Go ahead. No, I just, I, I want to say, because I, I think maybe uh, in this time in the closing after, you know, I call for the vote and we do it, I, I would rather have some stuff out now that's going to make my opinion pretty obvious, but I want it out now rather than dragging out what I'm going to say then. Um, I actually, um, first, I am listening. We have had some comments made that we're not. I've read every email. People have reached out to me. I, I've, I've listened. Um, I think the understanding has to be that, um, as Member Hatcher has said and Member Busby, there is no win here. I, th I think we all know the win is that this never happened, that um, we are not going to be able to, we can't make every, um, we can't anticipate every event. We didn't anticipate this. I, I never had this on my 2020 bingo, as everyone keeps saying. Um, excuse me. We can't anticipate everything that happens on campus or off campus. And so with that, we've got to do our very best to provide a safe return to campus for our students and staff. In listening, we, are, we clearly have opinions in the community schools, staff, parents, community members that are polar opposite uh, from each other. And so that means in listening, regardless of how each of us votes, we are not going to make someone else happy. That doesn't mean we didn't listen. It's just the honest truth, we, dis we disagreed. I believe, I can only speak for myself. I, um, I have told some friends, I've been staying up till four on the internet, <laughs> looking at data. I struggle with this every day. I have done my due diligence, and that's where I want to go real quick. Um, data is very important. I was the one that made a big deal about that. I acknowledge that. I asked for data. I wanted some more district level metrics, and we got them. Um, data is only as good as what you do with it. We have to look at numbers and, and look at what they're saying. Um, so I'm going to go over those real quick. The three metrics that I am looking at versus hospitalization, which was back in the beginning, the biggest concern statewide. And in um, June and July, it was, very, it was very dangerous. I mean, we can say, I think that's the easiest metric to quantify because it was a real time metric. It was day over day. I looked at the dashboard. I follow some people on Twitter that are doing hard looks every day, just putting out data information, not, not giving any opinion, just saying, this is where we are. And I look at dashboards and what I have seen, um, Week to week, we've had drops in cases and the hospitals are, are no longer at this point, we're at April levels. So I think regardless of where we fall on this, we should all be very happy that the, the high levels of hospitalization have dropped to, to April levels. The second thing you look at is the percent positive. Um, Member Hatcher touched on that a bit. My issue is I look at that, but then also as we know, we don't know how many people, we know um, from what I could tell on the dashboard, if it was more than 10, it counted if there were under 10 tested. I don't know, we, that's percent positive tested that day. We are right over five, right under five. We were under five the very first time. So we're very close and that is, it can be a little, um, 
there's some wiggle room on that. My biggest issue that I cannot get past and I cannot support is the caseload of 10 per 100,000. I looked at that. That is one ten thousandth of the population of our district, not our student population. That is the population of the people that live in our district. That is 61,000 people. That means the maximum we could have by this metric to return would be over the case of a solid week, no more than six probable or confirmed, not even confirmed, probable or confirmed cases would make that 10 per 100,000, which means we are talking the difference between six people and seven people. And I look at that and I cannot get past that because it is a number that is so small. It, I, you know, I don't want to be flippant, but it could be that we have six, there one, five confirmed cases and two were probable that the doctor was being conservative and they weren't, but that puts us into the, we can't go back. I cannot get past that number being so small that for us to be able to go back 10 per 100,000 is the difference between six and seven in a district of 61,000 people. And so I think that pretty much makes my opinion very obvious, but I want people to know that when I asked for data, because I was the one that harped on it, I absolutely wanted it. I wanted more zip codes. I wanted more county. I wanted more than just the state data, which at the time is all we had. I feel we have that. And I feel that I've spent a lot of time evaluating it. And so knowing the way I'm going to vote and the way I think we should go, it is not that I didn't look at data. It's not that I don't consider data. I understand that data is only good as what it's telling you. And I'm grateful to the county for giving us data that helps us and isn't just Maricopa County as a whole and the state as a whole. And so that is my comment. Um, so I may not say much when we vote. Um, um, Janet? I have, I have a question, kind of. Um, dovetailing to what Beth was talking about with the social and emotional issues. Whenever we get back to school, is there some sort of um, plan in place to help students that are, there's, because I'm assuming there's probably going to be more students that are going to need some sort of assistance, you know, based on issues with depression and anxiety and a myriad of other things. Do we have things in place or are we working on putting things in place to help these students? Member Busby, absolutely. In fact, we have that now. So our counselors have small groups, they are meeting with students and that will only continue and grow as we return to school. And then what about achievement gaps? Because there, there was a big concern at the end of last school year. Um, and the way that this, this school year is starting out, there, the instruction is more robust. But at the same time, I mean, there were a number of parents who expressed concerns about um, a lack of instruction or the instruction was not as as good as it could be if it were in person. And so there are bound to be achievement gaps. So are, are there things in place or what things are in place to help our students get up to where they're supposed to be? So Member Busby, just as we always do when we have students with gaps, the teachers work um, through our personalized learning programs that we have and we'll be assessing those students and then using our online learning programs as well as actual in-class lessons in small groups to make sure that those students can, are, are continually brought up to speed. Um, in addition, uh, we will be giving our benchmarks like, uh, and that's a requirement, but we um, always give benchmarks in the fall. So those will also show us the gaps that the students have so that we can actually use that data to help drive the instruction for those students. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Keep in mind, I am gonna, if, if you want to make a comment as you vote, we're gonna do that again. Do we have any questions or comments at this time? Okay, I'm gonna call the vote. 
All right, let me explain some things because of the nature of this vote and also because of the nature of what an I or a A means. Let me go into some detail for those of us on the board and also for those watching, because I know we have a lot of people watching and I don't want there to be any ambiguity, ambiguity on what we're voting on. Um, also keep in mind that as you vote, um, if you wanna take one or two minutes um, just to explain your vote, you're more than welcome to, you don't have to, um, you can. So the, as the motion is on the, is presented that it would be the recommendation to take the action to reserve to return at green 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 after two weeks or two weeks of green 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 returning the following Thursday or, I'm sorry let me go back green 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 for two weeks and then school would resume a week from the the Monday following the Thursday update that is the motion on the floor if you are voting I that means you are approving the changing of that metric to adopting the motion presented. If you vote nay, you're not accepting, you're voting no. And that also means that we would then be with the previous determination, which is a September 8th return. So an I vote is to move to the new proposal that is on the floor as recommended. A nay vote, you when you say nay, you are saying September 8th. So with that in mind, I'm gonna change yeah. it up. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yes. On this, on the uh, recommendations, it also says um, to place a reopening date of right. October 12th. So, yeah. The, so I'm sorry, I should have added that. Yeah, it's the green, 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 and if it's not met by the end of the first quarter, come back and reevaluate in October. You're right. And then a nay vote is to go with the previous determination, which is um, September 8th. So with that. I don't usually do this, but I'm going to because I feel that if I'm going to be the president of this board, I need to make the first vote. My name happens to follow in kind of the midpoint. I haven't had to do this. And I am, um, I'm showing the courage of my convictions in the vote I am now taking. And again, like I did in July, the vote I'm about to make is gonna make a lot of people unhappy. I don't know if it's gonna make anyone truly happy. There are going to be a lot of people unhappy with what I do, and there are people I know, but I'm saying this. I will defend my vote in July. I'm going to defend my vote today. Since July, the state has dramatically dropped in cases, in hospitalizations. We are close on our metrics. We are meeting them. The two metrics, my biggest metric was always hospitalizations. That was my big concern. That was the easiest one to quantif quantify and that has been met. The percent positive is right there. The 10 per 100,000 is something I can't, I can't accept. And that's my choice. I, I see that as almost um, statistically impossible. It is a near eradication. And according to Dr. Fauci, that will not happen, sadly. I wish it would. Even with the vaccine, he has stated this will not be eradicated. So with that in mind and knowing that we have concerns about safety for our teachers and our students and our staff. We also have concerns for the educational well being and mental well being of our students. My vote is nay to not approve the recommendation that is on the floor. Um, Member Brown. Thank you. I would just like to make the comment to all the uh, parents and staff and uh, community members that sent emails in, uh, I, and I know I can speak for all the board members and administration, we read every one of those. Um, I was also very impressed with the number that was sent in. That's outstanding to have that kind of feedback from our community. Uh, and I did personally read every one of those. Uh, a lot of good points were brought up and it really got me to look at some of the data a little differently. And um, it, it was all good communication and I appreciate that from the community. Uh, with that being said, I will vote no to the motion. Okay. Member Busby. Um, I just, I appreciate everybody's input. And it's important. And as I said before, you know, you heard, we've heard your comments and please keep providing your comments and your input. It is so vital to the 
to the health and strength of this district. And with that said, I am voting nay. Just, I'm sorry, could you, I, no. I lost you. No. no. Sorry, it got muffled. That's, That's all right. Uh, Member Hatcher. Um, I, I wrote out a statement, but I'm not going to read it. Um, but I do want to say some things prior to my vote. Um, anybody who knows me knows that I think independently. Um, they also know that I do my homework. So my vote came with hours of research. Um, speaking to some doctors, reading articles, uh, reading all the emails, as Member Brown said. It doesn't come lightly for me and for any of us. I know that. Um, it's, it's a difficult decision because we are balancing, um, in a sense, the academics against the fear of being sick with COVID and taking it home. And I think all of us understand those fears. But we've heard the, the other side uh, tonight and I really loved hearing from the students. So based on my conclusion, my conclusion based on the study of the metrics the survey results, which I cannot ignore. As Member Busby uh, mentioned, the majority of the parents wanted face-to-face. -face. Given what we learned uh, about the teacher's desire tonight, uh, I don't remember what the number was. Okay, 62% would return. There, there's a majority. I can't ignore that. So having said all that, I vote nay. Okay, Member Rich. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I, I agree with uh, the assessment on the numbers uh, that yourself, Member Hatcher, had mentioned. Um, I too think, think uh, I also think we made the right decision to delay until September 8th. I think it put us in a better position and uh, I also vote nay. Okay, so the motion fails zero to five. Um, sorry, scrolling up. Can I just say one more thing though? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I know. we gotta be careful because we voted. Um, we have no old business. Do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. All second. Second. No, I beat you. I get to second that one. Um, we have a motion and a second to adjourn, Member Rich. Aye. I'm an aye. Member Hatcher. Aye. Member Busby. Aye. Member Brown. Aye. Okay. And before I click off, everyone's free to click off. I want to thank everyone that um, stayed with us for nearly four hours. Thank you for listening. And um, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for your thank input. You. Thank you.